So good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome uh, to this uh, meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, I am Mary Tres Rossi. I'm the chair of um, Overview and Scrutiny. And this is the second time we've actually been able to hold a meeting in the town hall um, now that we um, don't do meetings remotely anymore. But the event is also being uh, streamed live on YouTube so members of the public can actually listen in. Um, can I ask everyone to wear a face mask when they are not speaking and to only remove it when they are called to speak? So I think we have to say I have the borough commander here today. Is the borough commander or your, the assistant borough commander? You are? Uh, so I'm Superintendent Michael Walsh. I'm the um, head of neighbourhoods um, for Central West Basic Command Unit, which covers the three boroughs of Westminster, K and C, H and F. Um, sadly, not the BCU commander. Thank you. And he is going to give us um, a presentation about crime and safety in the borough. Um, we have screens between people and asking people to actually um, keep seated most of the time um, just for, you know, to um, keep everyone safe. And um, so I would like to welcome everyone also who are watching on YouTube. And I think we should now um, start with 72 seconds of silence to remember those who lost their lives in the Grenfell tragedy. Thank you. Um, before we start the meeting, I'd ask members of the committee to only switch on their microphones when they are called to speak and to turn them off afterwards. Please remain seated when you are called um, to speak. And if I um, don't call you and you wish to speak, please raise your hand to get my attention. Um, members of the public who have been invited to speak will be invited to come um, to the microphone at the top here, it says on my left, um, and um, you will be invited to speak at the right time. Um, so I go on to apologies from, for absence. I have apologies from Councillor Adrian Beryl-Cox, Councillor David Lindsay, and Councillor Kazim Ali. Do any members have an interest to declare? <coughs> no? So I go on to the minutes. Um, there are two sets of minutes, one for the meeting of the 25th of May and the other for the meeting of the 10th of June. Um, does anyone have any comments or on these minutes or are they happy for me to sign them as a correct um, record of meeting? Yes? Okay, thank you. So, um, Overview and Scrutiny um, holds an annual statutory crime and disordered committee um, and um, to look at crime and disorder in the borough and we have invited uh, members of the borough police to come and attend. 
Um, as we said earlier, uh, the borough commander, Owen Richards, can't be here, but we have Superintendent Mike Walsh, who is going to take us through some slides about um, crime and disorder in the borough. So I'm going to hand over now to um, Mike Walsh. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully this will just connect. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll just start off by um, orienting you through the slides. All the slides that we're going to look at follow the same format. So the top right uh, are the trend lines. So those show the rolling 12-month period. The green line shows the most recent uh, 12 months, and the red line shows the previous 12 months for comparison. And then there's some narrative underneath, underneath which will explain uh, differences month on month, so this month compared to the last month, and then the comparison this year compared to the last year. In the top left is what we call heat maps. Uh, so that's just for the last month, and that shows where the, uh, the crime hotspots are. So that's done on volumetrics. The bottom left, which says offence, not all slides have this, but this is where you've got a crime type that's made up of a number of different subclassifications. It gives the total count of those subclasses uh, per month. And then the bottom right shows the wards um, per per volumetric of crime. So this first slide is what we call total notifiable offences, and in layman's speak, that just means all crime. Um, and we can see, if we look at the, uh, the red line, first of all, uh, which is last year, uh, there's a peak in August, which we always get, uh, and that's because of Notting Hill Carnival. And then we can see that there's a decline uh, when we come to the beginning uh, uh, of the, that last year, which is when lockdown began. Uh, and then as we get to the green line, uh, we can see where we've come out of lockdown. November, you see crime dips again when we went into the lockdown in November. We came out again in December and so on. So, so crime has absolutely followed uh, the trend of, of lockdown. When we've been in lockdown, crime has reduced. And when we've been out of lockdown, crime has, has increased. Our ambition is absolutely to, uh, to try and ensure as much as possible that crime doesn't rise back up to the levels that it was at in 2019. So, so that's a general overview of the slides. Uh, and so for total notifiable offences, for June, there were 1,592 offences. So that's uh, just under 17% uh, increase compared to uh, last year's um, almost 1,400 offences, uh, and a decrease of 5% compared to the previous month. Over the rolling 12 months, there were 1,856 offences, which is a decrease of 21% compared to last year's 23,000, just over 23,000 offences. So as I say, overall, this year we're down, but the ambition is to make sure that we stay down compared to 2019. So moving on to robbery. Uh, so for June, uh, for the last month, uh, there were 48 offences. So that's a 100% increase compared to the same time last year when there were 24 offences. And it's an increase of 33%. Uh, compared to last month uh, the Met of May when there were 36 offences. Over the rolling 12 months, there were 455 offences, uh, which is a decrease of 45, just over 45% compared to last year's 840 offences. Uh, overall knife crime, there's a really clear spike there actually in August uh, for the previous year. Again, that's, that's for Carnival, makes a heck of a difference for us, which we haven't seen uh, in the most recent rolling 12 months. So for June, there were uh, 43 offences, uh, that's, that's the last month, which is a decrease uh, of four per just over 4% compared to uh, last year's 45 offences and an increase of 30% compared to May's 33 offences. And over the previous rolling 12 months, there were 455 offences, which is a decrease of just over 35% compared to last year's 702 offences. So violence against the person, uh, this includes a number of, of types of what we call violence. Um, so this is excluding any type of domestic uh, uh, abuse, but it's made up of common assault. Uh, so that's really effectively a very minor injury. It could be if somebody's pushed um, or even spat at. Assault with injury, that's effectively what it is, is where we've got um, an assault, but it's a relatively minor injury. Uh, and then through to assaults with more serious injury, um, and then assaults in this category also includes harassment. So one of, the, uh, one of the interesting things we've seen with the crime trends through the COVID period, 
um, is that whereas a number of crime, crimes have, crime types have decreased um, because of the lockdown, uh, actually we've seen the harassment um, and antisocial behaviour has risen uh, because a lot of people have been uh, upset about house parties, about neighbours, um, etc. So that's one area where we haven't seen uh, any, uh, a decrease. Uh, so for uh, the most recent month of June, there were 385 offences, uh, which is an increase of uh, just under 19% compared to last year's 324 offences, and it's a decrease of just under 4% compared to uh, May's 400 offences. Over the previous 12 months, there were three, just under 4,000 offences, which is a decrease of just over 5% compared to last year's uh, 4,000 offences. Um, so the next slide is about domestics, um, so this is uh, all types of uh, domestic. Uh, the reporting picture around domestic, it, it's, um, it's a mixed picture because on the one hand we see an increase in the reporting of domestic as a positive. We know that many of our very vulnerable victims um, are terrified to come forward and report uh, abuse to the police. Uh, there is still a perception, uh, unfortunately, that the police won't take their uh, concerns seriously, which we absolutely do, and we're doing a huge amount of work to reassure people. But there's also, of course, the fear that there'll be retributions from their partners. So when we see an increase in reporting, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's been an increase in crime. It can be a positive uh, because it means that we're encouraging very vulnerable, often women, uh, to come forward uh, and report. Uh, so for last month, there were 152 offences which is a decrease of just under 26% uh, compared to the same month um, last year, which is 205 offences, uh, and it's a decrease of um, just under 15% compared to last month's 178 offences. If we look at the rolling 12-month period, there were just over 2,000 offences, which is a decrease um, of 5.5% compared to last year's 2,200 offences. Uh, the next slide is uh, residential burglary, uh, and for June there were 76 offences, which is a decrease of just over 6% compared to last year's uh, 81 offences, and a decrease of 10.5% uh, compared to May's 85 offences. Over the previous rolling 12 months, there were uh, sorry, 1,067 offences, which is a decrease of uh, just 23.5% well, compared to last year's uh, just under 1,400 offences. So non-residential burglary, so these are uh, effectively retail premises, um, warehouses, that sort of thing. Uh, for June, there were 17 offences, so we, we, fairly small numbers here, which is a decrease of 37% compared to last year's 27 offences and a decrease of uh, just over 41% compared to May's 29 offences. Over the previous role in 12 months, there were 349 offences, which is a decrease of uh, just under 44% compared to last year's 617 offences. So for drugs possession, um, again, a huge uh, spike usually in August because of Notting Hill Carnival, which we haven't seen um, this year. So for June, there were 75 offences, uh, which is a decrease of just under 15% compared to last year's 88 offences and a decrease of just under 11% compared to May's 84 offences. And over the previous rolling 12 months, there were just over 1,000 offences, which is a decrease of 25% compared to last year's 1,400 offences. So antisocial behaviour, um, you can see there, um, when you look at the red line, uh, which, which increases significantly in March. That's when lockdown began, the first lockdown began, and we saw significant numbers uh, of, of people reporting uh, COVID breaches effectively, uh, both on the street and then their neighbours, etc. So uh, a lot of understandably very distressed residents uh, about people uh, not following the, the, the lockdown rules. Um, so for the last month, there were 905 reports, which is a decrease of just under 33% compared to the same month uh, last year, uh, and an increase of 12% compared to the previous month. And then over the rolling 12-month period, there were uh, 11,600 reports, which is an increase of 30% compared to last year's uh, just under 9,000 reports. 
and you can see on the left that the antisocial behaviour is made up of three main different uh, uh, ca categories. So there's environmental, uh, there is nuisance and personal. Nuisance is, uh, makes up the vast bulk of that and that is predominantly uh, uh, somebody upset about another person, somebody else's behaviour predominantly. Uh, this slide is, uh, is uh, um, it's called I grade calls. What that means is uh, when somebody dials 999, um, if there is an immediate threat to life or to somebody's personal safety, it's graded as I, which is, stands for an immediate response. And we have 15 minutes to get to that call. So that's our, that's our target time to get there within 15 minutes of that call. Um, the red um, and the uh, black line, they are the previous role in 12 months. The red line um, it shows the uh, our overall response to eye calls, and the black line shows our response to domestic abuse. The uh, blue, the, 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 uh, the yellow line is our overall response uh, this rolling year, uh, and the blue line is our uh, response to domestic abuse over this rolling year. Um, I, when I started at Central West, um, so 18 months ago, before I had this current role, uh, for the first year I was head of response, so this was, this was my job. And when I came in and I started in December, um, you can see by looking at the red and the black line, my view, and I suspect that shared by people looking at this, is that our response to I grade calls was woeful. Um, so I did a huge amount of work um, with my teams to change the culture, change the performance regime, uh, and really get buy-in from my police officers about why responding to I-calls is so important with a real focus on domestic abuse. So for me, the victims of domestic abuse are some of our most vulnerable and most needy people in the community, some of the most vulnerable people that we will ever um, meet and respond to. And for me, I felt it the most important thing that we ensured that our response to domestic abuse was as good as it could possibly be. So there was a new performance regime, uh, a change of culture, uh, some real work that I did with my, my leaders, my inspectors and my sergeants to, to change that performance uh, 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 approach. So you can see that from November, December, uh, we saw a steady and significant improvement in that performance. Uh, and it brings us to pretty much the last couple of months where we have been more or less the best performing uh, BCU in the Met with our uh, response times consistently above the target time of 90% and consistently above the target time of 90% for domestic abuse, which, which I and uh, uh, other colleagues are very proud of. It, it's dipped a little bit in the last couple of months. Uh, I think that's due to uh, some of the challenges that we've seen um, around abstractions through COVID uh, and some of the um, big events across London, uh, which have meant that some of our police officers have been abstracted. Uh, but I know that the new superintendent, um, Terry Adderley, uh, is as keen as I was to ensure that those, uh, those targets are maintained. Um, the last slide um, is around um, stop and search. Um, and again, we can see in August uh, there is a big peak uh, that we would always get due to Carnival. The green line shows that we didn't have this peak in the most recent year because we didn't have Carnival. Um, so as well as being the neighbourhood superintendent, I'm also the BCU lead for stop and search. Uh, and really the, the narrative um, uh, that I set for the BCU is uh, that I want to see my officers doing stop and search. Stop and search. Stop and search. I hope there's not somebody there who disagrees with what I'm saying. <laughs> um, stop and search is a vital tactic that we have uh, in preventing crime, uh, particularly around uh, young boys who are stabbing each other and seriously injuring each other and killing each other. Um, so it is a critical, vital tool that we have, but the most important thing about stop and search is it needs to be evidence-led, intelligence-led, so we can't have police officers uh, who are going out and doing stop and, search, stop and search, what you would call a fishing expedition, so we have to be reassured that it's, it's based on intelligence. And really, really importantly, for me, it is about how that interaction is conducted. My expectation of my officers is that whenever they have a, a stop and search interaction, they treat that individual with respect, with dignity and with courtesy, and they fully explain the grounds and the reasons why that individual is being stopped. We have a really um, um, stringent monitoring process around our stop and search. So all of our stop and searches need to be supervised uh, by a supervisor. So that's a sar of the sergeant rank, uh, and I ensure that they are done. We're at a very, very high supervision rate on the, on the BC, which is good. That enables us to identify those individuals who are very good at stop and search. They have a good um, 
What, when I say hit rate, I mean in terms of their positive outcome, so they stop the right people and they get a good positive outcome, so that we want to identify them uh, so that they become, can become mentors for other people. But we also want to identify those people who don't do good stops. Uh, that might be predominantly because they're, they're, they might be lacking confidence or their skill set isn't there. So this is the opportunity around supervision to ensure that we identify those individuals and bring them up to the level that they need to be at. We also have, um, uh, well, I, I've set the direction on the, on the BCU that every supervisor will review three uh, body-worn video uh, footages every month. So that, that goes over and above the basic supervision. So they will actually review the whole stop and search uh, encounter to ensure that it's done professionally uh, and will give relevant feedback to the individual. We have our CMGs, our, our community monitoring groups, um, who hold us to account. Um, on a quarterly basis uh, for, a, for a full meeting and then every two months where they review the BWV as well. And I meet with the chairs uh, once a month and review the figures with them and any, any key headline uh, issues that we have. So the direction that I set is, is that I want to see the volume uh, maintained. I want to see our positive outcome rate uh, drop no lower than 20%. Uh, and for this borough, the, 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 uh, the, the stop and search uh, rate is, is higher than that. We have, a, we have a very good positive outcome rate. And as I say, I want to ensure that the stops are done uh, professionally um, and with courtesy and, and with integrity. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Mark Walsh. Um, I will now, um, if you would mind answering a few questions from the committee. Certainly. Yeah. So who would like to ask a question? Um, Councillor Hammond first. Thanks very much, Chair, and uh, thanks very much, Superintendent, for your uh, presentation and the work you've uh, uh, achieved on the I-grade uh, calls, which was well as illustrated by the slide. Uh, my question um, is drawn from the next paper that we're going to consider on the agenda. I don't know if you've actually seen that um, at all. If you haven't, then don't, you don't worry. In that case, I'll just describe the question rather than drawing your attention to the... Um, but we've just had the um, results in this paper of a crime and community safety survey which uh, residents completed, 312 residents completed. And I'm just interested in your comments on, uh, on this. Uh, these residents said that their community safety priorities uh, would be, well, 57% of them said antisocial behaviour is their top priority, 47% said drug offences, and 35% said violent crime. And that, that was the top three. I've no, I've no doubt there's quite a lot below that, but that's what we've been given as the top three. And then the ways of addressing crime, this is what the residents said, 75% of them said high visibility patrols by police and community safety wardens. So that 75% said that is their top answer. 56% said increasing CCTV. And 49% said greater enforcement against antisocial behaviour. And again, I'm sure there's a whole lot, lot of other things, but those are the top three. Just wondering if you, what your comments are on those um, results. Uh, so I would entirely agree with those results. I, I think the, the feedback from the community um, is spot on. Uh, I think those are very sensible priorities, and I think some of the suggestions they've given uh, are, are eminently sensible. Um, and it is what we are doing. Uh, you know, we have, uh, we're, we're aware of where our hotspots are. We're aware of, of where antisocial behaviour is, is occurring and other types of crime, violent crime, uh, and the, predominantly the Safer Neighbourhood team supported by our, um, uh, our VSU, our Violence Support Unit, uh, and others uh, are tasked into there, both to do the immediate short-term high visibility piece, uh, and that might include stop and search and other types of enforcement, but also uh, to work with colleagues in the local authority uh, and, uh, and with other partners to do longer-term problem-solving work. Um, I think it's worth mentioning, uh, myself and Stuart Priestley, the Head of Community Safety, we, are, uh, we have just set up what we've called a strategic uh, problem-solving group uh, where we're looking at uh, long-term sustainable solutions to big, challenging issues that the borough faces. Uh, and, and one of the priorities that we've identified um, is community engagement. And what we're seeking to do is to do a really thorough mapping of our communities to understand who our different communities are, to understand which communities are most affected by the um, community safety priorities and that the, the issues you mentioned there are, are definitely part of that. And then what we really want to do is, is, is uh, adopt an approach which we would call co-designing and co-delivering solutions. So we really and genuinely want to uh, include our communities in helping us come up with what problem solving might look like so that they don't just feel that the police and the local authority are doing solving to them, 
we want them to feel that they're completely involved and are part of the solution. Uh, and then engaging them in that way, the ambition is that they feel that they've got more confidence in us, they trust us more, and also our ambition is that we're coming up with solutions that are really meaningful um, and are sustainable. Thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Bakhtia. Thank you. Well, I was desperate to talk so I can get rid of the mask. <laughs> now, uh, what proportion or percentage of crimes uh, in the borough initiated or aggravated by drug use and supply? And is it linked to it? What percentage of it is linked to antisocial behavior, please? Um, so I'm afraid I don't. I don't have an actual figure, um, a specific figure on, on what that might be, but what I do know is, in my professional experience, there is a link between drug taking and drug dealing and crime. There's particularly a link between uh, drug dealing um, and gangs. We know that the gangs, a number of gangs are heavily involved in, in drug dealing. We know that there are county lines. We know that uh, young, vulnerable, uh, often children can be exploited by these gangs. Uh, and we also know that, that um, middle-class people who think it's okay to take cocaine on a Saturday night because that's their right to do, don't understand actually the impact that that can have on these young, vulnerable individuals who might be involved in county lines and dealing. Uh, we also know that um, uh, drug taking, uh, particularly those people who are on class A hard drugs, um, it can have an effect on, on other crime types such as shoplifting uh, uh, and other acquisitive crime types because they are um, effectively using crime to generate an income to fuel their drug habit. So whilst I don't have a figure on exactly what proportion of drug taking and drug supply f affects crime, what I do know it is a significant problem for us um, and it's something that we're, we're really passionate about, uh, about addressing. May I ask another question? Thank you. Uh, it feels like <clears throat> CCTV might be an answer to many, many problems, or some problems at least, because we have cases uh, dropped. We don't, we, because we didn't have enough evidence, we couldn't charge people. We have uh, people, tenant, council tenants, who are abusing the where they live for drug use or, abuse or supply. But because we don't have evidence, enough evidence, nothing could be done against them. How could we find a way to, uh, to encourage uh, CC, low, uh, private CCTV use in conjunction with the network of CCTVs the council or councils have? Could we find a way in between? Because this could be a, a way in the middle to find a solution for this. So I, I think that's a really good, a really good point. Um, I, the, I just quickly say that CCTV, it's not always the panacea that people sometimes think it is. I think where CCTV is it's most beneficial um, is when you have somebody viewing it live time uh, and we can direct police in or, or other colleagues to, to deal with that and arrest the offenders at the time. Sometimes retrospectively, uh, even if we capture footage of an incident, it might not always uh, help us because they might be uh, wearing a face mask. Well, certainly nowadays people are wearing face masks, so we can't always get identification. So there are many benefits of CCTV, but it's not necessarily um, the panacea that, that, that we might like it to, to believe it is. Your point around um, working with other partners to uh, increase the amount of footage we've, uh, CCTV we've got access to, I think that's a really good point, and I think that's probably something that Stuart and I can, can talk about and see what opportunities we've got to engage with with, with other businesses and, and third sector providers. Happy to take that away. Can I possibly add something to the answer on that? Yes, you may. Thank you. you. Um, Janet. So, um, as you know, we have, we are in the process of adding CCTV and we have a uh, we've met an additional investment of £500,000, but we also, as a result of that, have a CT CCTV strategy group, and we've just published a new CCTV strategy. And one of the things we absolutely uh, acknowledge is what you've raised, um, is uh, that there may be potential for uh, people, to, and we know some streets have done it already, or estates to have their own private networks, and how we as a council will you know, work with and support that. Um, 
So, and, that, and, and Stuart can speak far more eloquently than I about this. So it is definitely something within our strategy. Um, and I should probably also say that on, uh, on our housing estates in particular, we have, I think, about 500 uh, CCTV, but they're not monitored uh, with our, 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 our community safety ones at the moment. And again, one of our ambitions, and it's in that strategy, is to bring all of the CCTV together in our own control room so that we can make much, much better use of all of that. But uh, it, it's, it's, it's something we are working towards at the moment. I don't know if you, Stuart, you want to say anything. Uh, thank you, Emma. Yes, just briefly. Um, so, as part of the CCTV strategy, the Council has committed to develop a toolkit to support businesses and residents develop their own CCTV um, networks, which can add value to the CCTV that's available within uh, the whole of the borough to support the prevention and the detection of crime. So, that will be something that we're committed to publishing um, by the end of this financial year. And certainly we're looking at all means possible to use CCTV and encourage CCTV um, for, the, for the detection of, and prevention of crime uh, within the borough. And that, as I say, includes with residents and with businesses as well. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to uh, the lead member and uh, Stuart Beasley for their excellent work on the CCTV strategy. It's actually happening, and I'm really excited about it. So that'll be great. Thank you. Um, now, for the commander, I was happy to hear that you uh, are very interested in domestic violence, and I, um, our select committee is investigating interfamily domestic violence, and I was wondering, do you have stats, or do your stats reflect uh, violence against children and between siblings? And if so, how do you uh, find out about that? How is it reported? Because the child doesn't always have a voice. So, so yeah, the, the definition um, uh, does include that. Uh, I don't have a split, I'm afraid, about, about the different, so within my presentation, the different types of domestic violence, uh, but um, certainly my colleagues in public protection could get that to you and work with you uh, on that if, if, if that would be helpful. Okay. Councillor Pascal. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, firstly, I'd like to second the um, uh, thank you to um, both the lead member, Stuart Priestley, and to the uh, superintendent. Um, a question to you, uh, Superintendent. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the heat pump, heat maps that you've presented in this paper, presumably they are compatible with the software that Stuart Priestley uses internally. I think you mentioned the cooperation you had with him and his team. And the question is, um, through that joint working, um, have you managed to see how effective the work that is, if you like, overlapping and combined with the new ward wardens. And coupled with that, are there any other measures that you think that we as a council um, and as a community, it's not just the council, it's community, should be investing effort into building resilience, not just dealing with problems as they occur, but building resilience to stop them happening in the first place? Um, so. The, the police and the local authority, I think we work really well together here, um, both at a strategic level and at a tactical level. So we have the joint action groups where the local inspectors and sergeants meet up with their counterparts in the local authority. Uh, and at those meetings, we bring our intelligence and our heat maps, if you will, and, and um, Stuart's team bring theirs. We compare and contrast information and intelligence. And then on the back of that, joint problem solve, joint task, um, uh, and work together to develop solutions. Um, I'm always up for um, members of the community assisting us, uh, being involved uh, and helping us build resilience. And that can be anything from, from Neighbourhood Watch to uh, becoming involved uh, in, in scrutiny panels uh, or to becoming involved in what myself and the local authority want to do around community engagement and joint problem solving. Um, so I, th I think 
the question for me, actually, or more the solution for me is, uh, I would like to hear from the community about what they would like to do and how they would like to become more involved to, to increase resilience and strengthen that partnership working, uh, because both myself uh, and the local authority would be really keen uh, on working with them to deliver, to deliver that. Supplementary to that is one of the suggestions that some of our residents in the ward, which I represent, have made. Um, they've said that with the um, incredible development in the resolution of these things and the ubiquitous, I mean, I think we've got more, about two per person average across the population. Um, now, the, managing that capability to support what you're talking about would, is something I don't have suggestions for, but the, the question that some of our residents have asked is could they supplement the CCTV uh, coverage of the borough not in terms of everybody sneaking on everybody the whole time, but just if there is footage available um, when an incident happens as to whether you're able to capture that and make use of it or whether that's a red herring. So uh, just a small note of caution. So the first thing that I would say is um, if anybody witnesses a crime in action, the first thing they should do is phone the police. If it's an emergency, phone 999, uh, and if not, phone 101, because it is down to us to respond. That's what we're here for. And my expectation is that we get there and we respond. Um, if, however, for whatever reason, uh, or, or also in addition, um, if members of the public, your community, um, have captured footage on a phone, then absolutely that can be helpful to us. Uh, and as part of, um, of a crime investigation, we would always look for witnesses. Uh, we would take statements from, from people. Uh, we would gather CCTV, and if people have got footage on a mobile phone, then that could be really helpful. What I would caution against, though, is anybody putting themselves in a position where they could put themselves at risk in order to, to catch that footage. Councillor El Nagy and then um, Councillor Addenbrook. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much, Superintendent, for coming and uh, presenting to us uh, this uh, uh, overview of uh, our um, issue of safety in the war. Um, what's, um, uh, I congratulate you on the, really the approach and the staying closer to the community um, and the participation of the uh, uh, of the local community in the problem solving we are facing in this. But what are the main challenges in getting the community really to participate? Uh, uh, and what approach would you take uh, regarding uh, involving the youth uh, and the young people, the young adults in this uh, process? Thank you. Thank you. So my, my sense, uh, having only been on, on this BCU for seven months, uh, my sense is actually that there aren't too many obvious barri barriers. The, the feedback that we've had through community survey, uh, surveys is that people do want to be involved. So I think both myself and, and Stuart, we're, we're really excited and keen to harness that enthusiasm from the community um, and to start working with, with residents. Um, I think... Um, Potential barriers historically can have been coming to places like this and coming to other physical venues. I think the fact that we've now moved um, onto Teams and Zoom, uh, I think, is a really good thing. I think it enables a lot of people to become involved who wouldn't otherwise, either because they physically would struggle to get to a venue uh, at a certain time or a certain place. And also some people may just may not feel comfortable talking in that arena uh, and feel much more comfortable talking at home or at wherever, wherever they may be. So um, I, I'm, I'm confident that, that we've got that community um, spirit and engagement uh, and working with them, whatever is needed to engage people in whatever forum is the most appropriate, we will do. And to pick up your point about youths, absolutely, uh, that is a, a key priority for us. And I want the youth on this borough to have a voice. And I want them to have a voice that's listened to and, is, and, and that we act upon. This isn't just me and, and colleagues in the local authority just saying we want to do stuff for the sake of it. We genuinely care. We genuinely care about young people on this borough and we genuinely want them to have a voice. One of the things that uh, I'm looking at doing is setting up a youth IAG. So that's an independent advisory group. Uh, we have them for adults, but we don't have them for the youth yet. So this is a forum whereby um, youths on this, on this borough can come together and they effectively act as a critical friend to the police. So they would become 
tactical advisors to me and they can tell me and my command team and my colleagues about what we're doing well and why we're doing it well and they can tell us about the things that we think we're rubbish at and why and then we can work with them to understand what we need to do to be better. So uh, youth, youth is, is a central part to this. Um, without signing glib, they are our future, but also we know that tragically uh, many of our young, often boys, are disproportionately affected by crime and we want to do all we can to, to improve that situation. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Addenbrook. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Superintendent Walsh, for presenting your report. Um, I just wanted to highlight something that we're beginning to pick up from some of our residents, that they don't feel that they should report some of the minor crimes, like um, car theft, or it's not even theft, it's them getting, going outside in the morning and finding their door open and just things put over the seat. They haven't actually left anything in particular in their car. But the other area is burglary, and people have been in their houses and downstairs in the basement perhaps having supper, and somebody's come in upstairs and they don't feel that they should report it, or if they have, that they haven't got the response that perhaps they felt they should have got. And I think, so I think community engagement is really important going forward, because I think there is this nervousness amongst some people about reporting some of the crimes, because they don't feel it's perhaps important enough, but it does affect people. Um, so I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, so the first point I'd make is uh, absolutely people should report crime. This is what we're here for. We're here to protect people. We're here to make people safe. And we're here to listen to what their concerns are. And if they've been a victim of crime, I want to know about it. And I want to ensure that my teams look into it. That said, we have to be realistic. We cannot solve all crimes. It's, it's just impossible. If the evidence isn't there, we can't solve all crimes. Uh, but we will do everything that we can do to, to help residents. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is that often when we, even if we can't solve an individual crime, the fact that somebody's reported a crime to us can help us build a picture of where crime is happening and it can help us build that big strategic picture about where we need to put resource and where we need to focus attention. And it can also often help us try and work out who we think the offenders are in the area who may be committing this crime. So even if we can't solve an individual's crime, the big picture is it can massively help us to address crime in the long run. So I'd, I really would encourage people to, to, uh, to report any and all crime to us. The bit about burglary, um, you know, if somebody's been burgled, I, I was burgled when I was a young boy, and it's, and it's actually one of the reasons I, I, I joined the police, the really positive um, response I had from the local police officer. Uh, I know how it felt. It felt absolutely awful. My parents were on holiday, so I can completely empathise with anybody who's been, who's been burgled. So if you are in your premises and you are being burgled, phone 999 and we will be there. We will come with everybody to come and help you. Um, if it's happened uh, and it's happened later, you won't get that immediate response, but we will come, we will investigate it, and we will take all forensic opportunities and every investigative opportunity we can uh, to, to try and find out who's done it. And again, the other thing with burglary is um, often, often individual burglars have a particular what's called MO, modus operandi, so even if we can't solve that one particular burglary, we can sometimes identify who somebody is by trends and patterns of behaviour. So again, all comes back to please report crime. Uh, that's what we're here for and we want to help. So if there are no more questions, thank you very much, Superintendent Wolf, for coming along and for your presentation and for answering our questions. It's very much appreciated. So thank you. Chair, if, I'm, if you might indulge me, um, I just also wanted to um, add my thanks to Mike for coming tonight and, and really just to let everyone here know that um, I, I've found both particularly him but his colleagues um, fantastically constructive to work with. Um, one of the things I've really appreciated is that they're very open to constructive criticism, which, you know... Uh, uh, which you know you have to you have to have that dialogue, um, but really proactive and want to do things as I think you've, he's very eloquently explained himself. Um, and my view is we can only tackle the problems if we have good relationships both with our local police and they have good relationships with residents. So I really, really am grateful to Mike and his colleagues for just being so kind of um, I can't think of the right word, but thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Councillor Will. Thank you. So now I think we will move on to uh, paper A5, which is a report completed in support of the Safer Kensington and Chelsea Partnership 
Community Safety Plan. Um, this is coming quite early to committee, and um, the report set out the timeline, which concludes in December, this December, with a report to full council. So it is an opportunity here um, for us to express our views and those of residents and um, to hopefully have some influence on, on the outcome. And so I would like to hand over now to Councillor Emma Will. Emma, do you want to introduce or... Um, I'm, I'm just going to say two words and then I'll, I'll, I'll hang over, hand over to Stuart. Um, so thank you very much all for giving us this opportunity to bring this paper. Um, and uh, as you've rightly said, we, we brought it early because it is really important. We know whenever we consult with residents, crime, fear of crime in particular, it is a, you know, one of the top one or second I issue for residents. Um, we, we do have to, every, every three years, refresh our plan. We're in the process of doing that. And really what we've, we've presented to you here is what we've heard so far uh, back from residents. As I say, Stuart can, can speak more uh, uh, in more detail and absolutely welcome your thoughts and comments at this stage. Thank you, Stuart Priestley. Thank you. Um, so actually, I'm going to be a brief because we've touched on some of this already. So we, um, as Emma said, we're bringing this early for comments and views on both process um, and the direction of travel. Um, the plan itself, sorry. Maybe if you lift it a bit, lift it up. Is that, is that okay? Can you hear me now? Sorry. Um, so the, uh, so the, the plan itself is, is both the council's community safety plan, but it's also, obviously, community safety is delivered in partnership, and the council is part of a statutory community safety partnership, and it functions as the uh, community safety partnership's plan. It is founded upon two things, really. One is an analysis of crime and antisocial behaviour issues, and then the other, which we've we've heard already this evening, are the views of residents and stakeholders, and we've undertaken um, quite extensive um, engagement and consultation with residents and stakeholders, and they've shared with us their views. Those have been endorsed by the Community Safety Partnership, and you've heard this evening, uh, Mike, endorsed those priorities. Um, those priorities being... Uh, tackling antisocial behaviour, tackling drug-related offending, um, uh, tackling uh, violence and violence against women and girls. What we heard very strongly from residents as well, and again this has been mentioned this evening, was a real desire to work with the police and with the council and with partners um, to be able to help us understand um, their lived experience um, and the issues that people um, deal with every day, but also to be part of the solution, to bring the sort of part of, of the solution. So one of the key priorities for us going forward is this thing about co-design and co-delivery with residents, and that will be a strong theme within the community safety plan. At um, 5.3 and 5.4, um, these paragraphs briefly set out the what, what we're proposing around the structure of the plan. I won't go into great deal, detail around that, but what, what I will say is that there's some sort of cross-cutting themes, um, and those are around prevention and early intervention, targeted support services, engaging with communities, co-design, as I've already said, um, and environmental measures. And I think um, by way of... Uh, uh, sort of introduction. That's all, all I wanted to say, uh, Madam Chairman. I'm happy to take any, any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Priestley. Questions? Um, Councillor Hammond. Thanks very much, Chair, and uh, to the lead member and uh, Stuart both. Thank you very much indeed for the report. I don't think this is actually a question, but I, I think um, it's more feedback, but you can come back to me on it. But at 4.4 with the uh, three priorities. Uh, I'm, I'd certainly personally endorse them from what I'm hearing back from my residents in Courtfield Ward. Um, the one I'd expand on, though, antisocial behaviour, I, I appreciate the, what you've got in there. I think, I presume they're a list of examples rather than ex an exclusive list. But the ones I'm, 
I hear a lot about, actually it's bikes and the new scooters being ridden on the pavements. It comes up time and time again and more so in the last, perhaps in the last year than in the, the previous two years. Um, and, I, and I'm sure that's, that would be included within that ASB. And the other one, which is more of a visual one that I think we all see is the outbreak of graffiti that we've had. Uh, and I would, I would think that that belongs in this, um, in this category as something we ought to be addressing, because if you address the small things, uh, I think that feeds through into the, the bigger things. But please do come back to me if you think I'm talking sense or nonsense. Uh, uh, you go ahead, Tim. Sorry. Um, I, I would certainly say sense. Um, and uh, those are our priorities for um, which would fall under the tackling antisocial behaviour theme. You're completely right, Greg, about the sort of what we call the broken window syndrome, whereby kind of graffiti just adds to and in, in some eyes legitimates kind of poor behaviour um, and sort of can lead to crime. So colleagues within environmental health services, well, one of their priorities is to respond very quickly to graffiti um, and those sorts of concerns, and we work very closely with them. And through the wardens and, and the Crest project and trying to join up some of the services within environment and communities, which it, as a business group has both the wardens and all of those services, so that we can swiftly move to respond to, the, to those issues. On the issues of kind of cycling on pavement, I mean, cycling on pavement's been a challenge so as long as there's been bikes. It's been added to with, with these electronic scooters now, and some of the behaviour that I've seen has been very, very concerning and downright dangerous. That will be a priority for our wardens to be able to respond to that, you know, be able to look at that. Um, but that's sort of an emerging theme, the electronic scooters as well as the, the pedal scooters for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Antisocial behaviour, we have few cases, I'm aware of at least four or five cases. If dealt with properly by the housing team, it will never turn into antisocial behaviour. We have families with autistic children being placed in places with people, retired people, people who are already with their own problem. This created a, a, a turned their household, the neighborhood, into chaos. So this is a mixed thing. But when it comes when we mix this, to, link this to crime and drug use and abuse and supply. Again, I'll come back to CCTV because, in my view, it is a preventative measure, deter criminals or those, those who are supplying and because we have cases, people distributing drugs without any fear because they're not afraid because they are terrorizing the neighborhood and there can't be any evidence collected against them to be used against them to, to take for the council to take action against them. So crime hotspots, since we have identified from the previous reports, we have hotspots if we make them as a priority and install CCTVs, that might be a good pre preventative measure, I think. Thank you. Thank you. There's some really good points in there, um, if I may. But we work um, within the community safety team. Um, we work very closely with the police and with housing uh, management services and other providers of housing to be able to respond to antisocial behaviour. We have a, um, a weekly joint tasking meeting, sort of an analysis and joint tasking meeting, where we, we look at the most pressing antisocial behaviour issues and, and try and respond to those. I do, I completely understand what you're saying about some of the um, sort of housing placements, um, and that's something that sort of sits outside of my purview, but I do work very closely with my colleagues within housing needs. I think you raise a really good point about people who are uh, drug dealing um, and committing antisocial behaviour without fear. And actually, we really do need to bring the fear to them. We need them to be fearful, them to be anxious, not the broader community. So I think that that should be part of our, our overall strategy in shifting that culture of fear 
the cultural fear should not be within our communities, it should be with the criminals who are seeking to operate within our communities, because people like Michael come along and slap the handcuffs on them. Um, that's an oversimplistic kind of assessment, but, but I think there's lots of things that we need to do to make it harder for criminals to operate within our communities. CCTV is one of those. CCTV will only, CCTV work is, is more effective with certain crimes than others and is more effective as part of a joined up problem solving approach. And you've heard Mike earlier talk about the problem solving approaches that we've developed, um, both on a kind of an operational tactical level but also on a strategic level and trying to bring some longer term strategic problem solving to some of the issues that you've described, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor um, Addenbrook. Oh, sorry, could okay. I just add something? Sure. I just, because I, I, I think this is a really important issue you've raised. I think some of the most depressing conversations I've had with residents on estates who you know, are really frightened of, of what's going on around them. They're frightened to come out their own front door. They're frightened for their children. And I suspect a lot of that, and some of it's related to drugs and other issues you've raised, and a lot of it probably doesn't get reported because they're frightened. Um, and I absolutely endorse what Stuart's saying, is that somehow we have to change the dynamics so that people aren't frightened and they feel, conf you know, they own their estates, not the people who, you know, are, are terrifying them and doing bad things. I know we, we are trying to work more closely with housing because a lot of that does sit with them, particularly allocations. Um, and I know um, we piloted a, a, a warden program in Lanc Lancaster West and we're talking to them about uh, what is the potential perhaps to have wardens uh, on estates because some of it's very low level and it comes back to this broken windows that if you start to make those places feel safe and right again then you then you suppress the, the, the bigger problems you know which the police do need to come in and deal with obviously uh, like, like drugs um, so um, I, I can't promise you that we, we have the answer and it is complicated but I think we are all very conscious uh, that it's something that we we need to try and find new ways uh, to tackle and deal with and the CCTV is part of it but it isn't a panacea for everything um, sadly thank you councillor Addenbrook thank you chair in fact councillor Bakhtia has asked my question because I think <laughs> And you've answered it. Because I did, we have seen a big issue with housing providers, not the stock, but the, you know, the Peabody's, the Notting Hill Trust, etc., who I think they're putting too many residents with similar um, issues in the same buildings. And it's just, in some places, it's out of control. And I think the other thing is that we, we know we're going to see an increase in mental health issues as we come out of this lockdown. Um, and... Are we working with health at all? The health part, I, I see public health as part of the partnership, but not health. And I just wonder if there's something more that we could do with the health services on that. Um, I think that's an excellent point. Some of the meetings we've had with housing, we have had adult social care there as well, but I, perhaps not as regularly as we should. And... I think you're absolutely right about, sadly, that we'll see more mental health, and we probably need to make sure that they are. They are sometimes, aren't they, Stuart? But not always. Uh, can I just add that um, there are a lot of problems in the, in the Earl's Court area, which is not my ward, but near to where I live, because I think a lot of people with problems are put into hostels, and people, uh, the high degree of people with mental health problems. And, and that has, there's a lot of begging as well. And... I think we do have to think about where we are placing people because if you concentrate them too much in one area, you are going to exacerbate problems that are already there, I think. So, so, it's, so it's, if, if I may, I think that's a very valid point. And I think that um, this is an area that has already generated some work and, and um, between colleagues um, in housing and mental health services, looking at the, particularly around Earls Court, around placements. But there are also within Earls Court a number of uh, housing providers which are completely independent of the council as well. And I think Earls Court does, um, I think it's probably because of history and the physical makeup of the buildings, um, but there, are, there is a lot of supported housing 
um, for people with various uh, levels of need, um, as well as uh, as well as other services. So there is a, there is an over concentration, perhaps, of those services within, uh, or, a co or a more of a concentration of those services within Hills Court, and that's some some of the challenges. But certainly, my colleagues in housing needs and mental health are alive to some of the challenges and are kind of working collaboratively to address some of those concerns. But I, I, but I fully accept some of the, some of the concerns that, have been, that we've heard today. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pascal. Uh, um, I might, if, can I hear from the committee and then I'll let you do that, okay? Councillor Pascal. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I was just going to ask a question on the general front of if in developing this strategy, whether there are any further issues or so focus could be put also on this further development of community resilience or you know, ability to resist the problems that are occurring either individually or collectively in, in, in the community. And uh, a, a, a lot of questions have been answered. One of the key components in this seems to be the schools. Do you work with the schools in partnership um, and educational establishments and youth centres and so on as well? Um, because helping th those in our community who are growing up and are well-intentioned uh, to resist peer pressure to be taken away from their desired journey for going forward, um, it seems to me to be something that's important. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I, I think um, we've heard already this evening from uh, Superintendent Wise about the importance of building trust. And building trust is part of building resilience, actually. So if our communities trust the council and the police um, to uh, be able to respond to these issues, if we can build that trust, then we're, we're in, in part we're building that resilience. Um, our desire to work closely with communities to, to listen to them to un, un, understand their issues um, and to co-design and where appropriate co-deliver solutions to these issues is part of that, that building resilience agenda I think um, and that will be reflected in the strategy uh, certainly the, the, the strategy in the whole of the approach is founded upon partnership and that includes partnership with, with schools this partnership with um, the voluntary and community uh, sectors uh, and those organisations that are delivering services to uh, young people, uh, both in school settings and education settings, but also outside of that. And we will work, we work very closely with uh, organisations like the Harrow Club um, uh, and other VCS partners in, in um, delivering services um, and delivering responses within the community. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Evans. I uh, just wanted to say that I welcome this report and I, the provisions that you mentioned in 5.4 will be very helpful to the community. I think the more you get people on side involved in the problem, uh, will help with the solution. So I welcome this report. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, um, Jackie, can I, Mr. O'Connor would like to say something. Is it here? Okay, is that my left or right? It's my either. It's the wrong side. Um, Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Committee. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick statement because you mentioned Lancaster West Estate and the Wardens. And uh, one of the things I would say, the Wardens were a good thing on the estate, but they have no powers of arrest and no real powers to, to do much with people. So they haven't really been able to do much with the antisocial behaviour because the people doing the antisocial behaviour pretty much ignore them or move out of the way. So a real solution to that kind of problem seems to be it has to be with the police, I think. And we have been asking continuously for proper, for more police patrols 
and for a greater police presence on the estate because we do have a lot of issues with an antisocial behaviour on both sides of the estate caused by different problems. So the wardens are good, they provide reassurance, but they're more of a stopgap than anything else. And one of the other things I wanted to say is in terms of uh, temporary residents, Lancaster West has a very high proportion of temporary residents, and temporary residents do tend to have severe problems because that's why they've ended up homeless and temporarily housed. And the ones who get to be housed in borough have especially severe problems. And that means that our estate has become full of people uh, with severe mental problems, uh, antisocial behaviour problems. So it, it's caused a lot of problems in the area, not because of the people themselves, but because of the way they behave and the fact that there's so many of them concentrated in our estate. And I think I, I, I don't have a solution for the problems themselves, but I feel that a lot of these people shouldn't be being housed on their own. For example, I have a woman uh, who lives opposite my house and I can hear her screaming at no one every yeah. morning, 6 o'clock. Yeah. Irregularly, uh, she wakes everyone else up in the entire block. And I can't imagine what it's like living next to her because the sound, I mean, it's, it's pretty terrible and it's regular. So those kind of things, I feel there needs to be more support for the people being placed in these houses. You can't just put people there and leave them. And then when their neighbours finally complain enough to the police, maybe they do something about it or section them for a short while because we have a lot of uh, people who are housed on our estate who have drug problems which causes mental health problems, which causes them to behave erratically to their neighbours. Um, so I don't have big solutions for any of it, but I would like to ask that there's more consideration given to how you distribute people uh, and also what you do if people are causing problems with their neighbours because you get neighbours, they fall out with people and if you fall out with someone who has a mental health issue, that can be very serious for your well-being and your own mental health. So that, that was just a bit my opinion. Thank you very much for that contribution. And um, you know, thank you, Emma and, and Stuart, for coming, and, and also Superintendent Walsh. I think there's a lot to think about. And, and these problems, there is no easy solution to them. But I think, um, you know, we have to... We're coming in here at an early stage and, and raising a few things, and, you know, let's hope we can make some progress. But, I mean, they are really hard problems to deal with, I think. So thank you for coming along. Thank you. So um, we now turn to the scrutiny um, stock take. Um, this was done by the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny, looking at the um, scrutiny arrangements that we put in place in May 2019. And um, it is this committee that is overall responsible for the effectiveness of scrutiny. And um, it is this committee that must always look for ways to improve. Um, and if you'll notice if you read the stock take, is the final column is empty because we haven't put um, the reply in because the reply will be put in when this committee has spoken about it um, tonight. But also, <coughs> I'm aware that three members of the committee are not here tonight, and I will contact them as well, because I want to get feedback from everyone. Um, we have had a discussion amongst the chairs, because uh, the chairs are mentioned in it. And, you know, as you will see from reading it, you know, there is, it's a kind of, could do better uh, response in that, you know, uh, there has been some improvement, but there is more that has to be done. And I, I felt that it was, you know, the, some of the criticism was at me, myself, and also at the chairs. So I thought that we ought to um, have a discussion between ourselves, but now it is the time for um, the committee, really, um, and I'm would like to hear from all of you um, what you feel about um, the stock take. We don't have to take it as 100%, you know, right, but we do really have to take it seriously because it's an external evaluation of, you know, how we are operating in scrutiny. And, you know, there are ch charges all the time these days that 
you know, we're marking our own homework, but this is actually someone um, examining us and how they think we've performed over the last two years. Um, I have members of the public who would like to speak, uh, Kimia and also David O'Connell and Abbas Dadu. So I would like you to come and speak to the committee. We're very interested to hear what you have to say. Um, but if you would then, but then I want to hear from the committee. So if, if you would like to come and address the committee now. So, Kimia. So we're very interested in what you have to say, but then I would ask you afterwards to allow the um, committee to speak. I, we have to hear from them what they have to say. Okay, I'm just saying we're very interested in hearing what you have to say about the top cake, but um, when the, we want to hear what you have to say, but then we will, after we've heard um, David O'Connell and Abbas, we will then turn back to the committee and I have to hear what the committee have to say because it's very important. Change will only happen to the extent that the committee takes it on board and, and, and discusses it, and that, that's how it will happen. But anyway, we would very much like to hear what you have to say about the stock take. Thank you, Kimia. Is that it? That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Chair, Madam Chair, and councillors. Um, I wanted to say that it's always very difficult coming here and speaking to you all, um, but it is important and so we persevere. For every 72 seconds of silence for the deceased, there are mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, partners, children, grandparents and grandchildren. And Grenfell Next of Kin is a support group for those immediate family members. It was not set up by... Um, so it was not set up or funded by the government and supported by the council and through the council. It is, in its purest form, an expression of need by people who, now, who know not only the brutality of the night but in the aftermath to offer support to each other, amplify their voice in the manner they find safe and comfortable, and stop the systemic exploitation of the crime done to them. Your officer, Callum Wilson, said here in this chamber, Often, it's just you, in his rather special patronizing voice, failing to understand it is difficult for those at the heart of this tragedy to set foot in this building or to face their abusers. Surely the first level of compassion is to recognize that. They cannot sit in more meetings when they have tried and been abused and humiliated and spoken their truth to Callum on countless occasions. They have come to scrutiny meetings and been delegitimized, their presence ignored, their evidence uh, and their evidence ignored. They were promised inclusion and engagement which did not materialize and recommendations were made diametrically opposed to all the evidence put before them. No scrutiny, no accountability, no change. As one councillor put it at a recent full council meeting, this council should never have been left in charge of the aftermath and recovery of this national disaster. The council is at the centre of a criminal investigation for manslaughter, a major public inquiry and civil litigation. It is simply illogical, possibly illegal, that it was left in charge of the traumatised community of North Kensington, the survivors, the bereaved and the next of kin of the deceased. How can the abuser under investigation be left in charge of the welfare of the abused? So please understand and respect the very visceral reaction for next of kin to set foot in this building or have to deal with some of the councillors who've been left in charge of community when they have felt the humiliation of disdain. The leader says she would put her life on the line to say the officers are doing their job. Before making such dramatic statements, the leader should consider the facts. Please bear in mind that the next of kin have had to shoulder the heaviest burden, not only suffering such violence in the manner of the negligence that killed their kin, but also in all the ongoing work with police, lawyers and witness accounts. They're the ones who, who were on the phone to their loved ones that night, had to listen to final goodbye messages, listen to the desperate 999 please. 
They're the ones who've had to identify and hear the details of the horror and relive it over and over again. This specific group are at the heart of the violence. Since they are so caught up in the systems and processes, their resilience is low to come to these interminable meetings and engagements. They have an intrinsic right to representation and advocacy. Without it, they are disadvantaged. Instead, counselors and officers target, bully, intimidate, and set the tone for others to do so also. They mock and trivialize what is being said, knowing full well the relevance and necessity of it. A counselor referred to our attitude as contumely. No, it is not contumely, and we didn't have to look it up, or at least I didn't. We simply cannot be sycophants when the evidence suggests it would, not, it would be inappropriate under the circumstances. Another referred to the next of kin as an annoying little group. There's a lot of them out there. No, there are 72 people who died with a very specific number of mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, partners, children, grandparents, and grandchildren. This is not little. Please do not delegitimize or be little. In addition, there are real cultural specificities of the victims, and their right to amplify their voice how they see fit has to be respected. Perhaps it's the cultural problem for this council. I've sat in meetings where the leader of this council has said to a son of the deceased, you do speak English rather well. Another meeting where the deputy leader of the council said to a woman who lost her husband in the fire and his daughter, I bought you a house, what more do you want? In a shameful tone of disrespect. I've sat in meetings where officers have called us names ranging from liars to far, far worse. I have documents and notes. Just as in the aftermath of Hillsborough, the Right Reverend Bishop James Jones highlighted in his seminal work the patronizing disposition of unaccountable power, or the aftermath of the Aberfan disaster, which found the authorities' misfeasance in handling the charitable donations due to the victims corrupt. This disaster, too, deserves the same analysis in the aftermath. And the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, the most expensive place to live in the UK, with 38 embassies and high commissions, nicknamed the Monaco of Britain, home to the future king and queen, will one day have to answer. But it will not take 20 years for that report. Justice will come limping. Pede Claudio, for those who understand Latin. For over three years, we've told your officers and leadership team of the failures causing tremendous re-traumatization, brutalization, and exploitation of this disaster, which is now called the Grenfell Industry, a cash machine with the pin number Grenfell. Careers have been made on the back of this tragedy. The profligacy and misinformation, denial and obstruction by the officers is shameless. Next of kin exposed the scandal of the 50 million pound de um, dedicated service budget. In trying to inform the bereaved and survivors, the council officers sent, instead sent letters with deliberate disinformation to target the next of kin, which led to bullying and intimidation. That was the strategy of the officer in charge to scrutiny, rightful scrutiny. And when the facts and structures that this council created and actively emboldened was exposed, the, wasted, the waste of more than half of the ring fence budget, the cost of the rental of the buildings and the salaries, the 400 million pounds spent with no real line by line itemized breakdown, no value for money examination, when all that is exposed, despite their denials and their deliberate ostracizing, marginalizing, and bullying, there is no apology, no acknowledgement of the pain they put people through who correctly challenged them, and the hours of work it took by the very victims who were supposed to be helped to be heard. And there are no consequences for those officers or for the counselors who knew and were willfully looking the other way. And it still continues with the same people still in charge, the same culture and the same obfuscation and denial. So what do we do? Leave them to it, give up, be worn down, because that has seen, that has been the, this council's modus operandi, as we can see from the inquiry evidence. Name calling, blacklisting, threatening, mocking, ignoring until individuals give up or the worst happens as it did on June the 14th. Do we try to engage through the scrutiny system? That is a gargantuan task when the council has a huge machinery, a culture to cover for itself, to minimize reputational damage given the litigation and the victims at the heart of this are low on resilience, digitally or culturally handicapped. 
had we not heard by the leader the accidental reference to the CFGS report, we would not have known this important review being done into the Council's scrutiny process, dependent on the Council's own comms teams and only half a dozen councillors who actually responded. At the heart of this is a community who bore witness to the most brutal live crime. To give you a parallel, in the George Floyd case, 12 witnesses watched as Mr. Floyd was killed in 9 minutes and 29 seconds. Here in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, hundreds of community, family and friends watched for hours as their friends and family lost their lives. They watched the building burn for days. For nearly a year they lived with the charred remains and for four years they've seen nothing but arrogance, no remorse, defensiveness and not one minute of peace, no justice. North Kensington is now under occupation, not in recovery. Are these Kimia, could the you bring your uh, remarks to a close, please, because I, you've I been speaking for a you. while. Okay. Are these the values of the Royal Borough? We had to fight for the review of the dedicated service. Now three years and 32 minutes from £50 million too late, with no consequences for the officers or the councillors. There are no apologies. And in fact, the same people are left in charge of the review. That is fundamentally wrong and at cross-purposes. But it's the same pattern of the council being left in charge after the catastrophe with a loaded gun, a blank check to, make his, to mark its own homework. Again, who guards the guards? Custodiat, ipsos custodet. And now there is going to be even less scrutiny with even more obstacles, even more meetings with people who are not engagement professionals. Engagement and consultation are more than just words. Another two years will pass and the Royal Borough will be off the hook, back to business as usual, with the next of kin and survivors and community at the heart of this crime not tangibly helped or supported. No change. What do you think will happen then? We should embrace the values and sense of duty and service that this catastrophe demanded of us. We should make an unashamedly patriotic case for our nationhood, pride, our value for decency, fairness and justice, and ditch the introspection, denial, obfuscation, self-protection and backwardness that has fogged this council. This is a multi-ethnic diverse corner of our England and it requires new approach for the generation that are coming into its own under the shadow of the towering injustice of Grenfell. We want a full line-by-line, line, itemized account of the £400 million pounds the Council has spent on Grenfell post-fire. We want more scrutiny, not less, and we want to design what that scrutiny of Grenfell looks like. We want engagement professionals, not councillors and officers who are hand in glove with cronies that they favour, creating a toxic one-dimensional outcomes and atmosphere. There has to be a reset without the baggage and crony relationships. We want empowerment for the next of kin and the community and the survivors and the wider bereaved to shape their own personal recoveries. This system of preferred partners keeps people trapped in victimhood and pathologizes the community as there is a paycheck at the end of it for those who gain from keeping people trapped. Or as one next of kin put it, as long as we have a problem, they have a paycheck. Not too far into the future, it, it, not too far in the future, history will record how RBKC failed, not only in creating the conditions in which the fire could occur, but also in the aftermath. The truth crush to the earth does rise again. Councillors, you have the power to collectively insist on our moral, moral compass. Less scrutiny is not the way forward. Thank you. Mr O'Connell. And Abbas, does he, do you also wish to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, I would say that I agree with a lot of what was said in that about the scrutiny, and it's one of the things that we said a lot when we talked to the um, Centre for Good Scrutiny as well. As, see, in the report, it has a lot of recommendations for things to do, but the problem we have is with the details of how those things are done. 
So it says that there should be better information provided by the officers to councillors, which makes sense to me. But it's also, what is that information that's provided? Because our experience of scrutiny has been that there never is a detailed report provided, not even to the councillors. There's only sort of vague outlines. In fact, we've been asking about the financing of some aspects of the Grenfell recovery for two years now, and yet we still don't, be, we aren't any closer to the numbers as they really are, and that includes going to the Audit Committee and asking, can we have a detailed breakdown? In fact, at the last one we were at, uh, one of the councillors himself said, can I have a proper line-by-line -line breakdown of all the costs? And I think, unless you start by knowing exactly what the issues are, I don't see how any scrutiny can make any difference. And that sort of brings me to the, the second point, is that um, engagement. So you talk about engaging with the community and things like that, but I feel that the way the engagement actually works in the council is that select people are picked and they are taken and, and their views are canvassed and other people never get to find out what was happening or what the survey was or what the information the council needed. So when you're only operating with half the information or bits and pieces of selected information, any decisions you make will of course be, diff uh, uh, will go along with the status quo. And the final point I'd like to make about scrutiny, or the second penultimate point really, is that there needs to be change from the scrutiny. Because I've been to lots of scrutiny meetings, I've made statements, we've talked about numbers, yet the final report that comes out or goes to leadership at the end is always the same. So the scrutiny itself has made no difference. I mean, I'm, I, I don't mean to, to downplay your role, councillors. I understand how important it is and how much you put into doing this. But I feel it's some, somewhere along the line, none of the recommendations that go in the report make any difference to what finally is approved by the council. So that, that's my opinion. So obviously, I would hope that the report gives you an opportunity to try and fine tune that. And I think one of the best examples of that is at the end of the report where he talks about Grenfell matters, and he says, and you actually talk here about finding a way to better scrutinise Grenfell related matters, and I would suggest that maybe the Grenfell Scrutiny Committee is the best way to scrutinise that in the first place. And all of this spreading it around across different committees has failed completely because, I mean, there is, as it talks in the report, no coherence to the way issues are investigated. And that's not through any fault of the councillors, but it's a fault of the actual system because everyone is op operating isolated in different old committees. So I hope that this report will make some big differences. I would love to try and input as much as possible into the process and to shape the process because it seems here that you will go away over the summer and come back with the sort of finalised shape of the scrutiny. And I think that's a really important thing because without good scrutiny, the council can't function properly because councillors can think everything is working and it's hunky-dory because the officers are telling them that, but on the ground things can be very different. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now I would uh, like to bring in members of, of the committee. Um, I'll go to Councillor Hammond first. Would you like to um, give your views of what you've thought of the um, stock take? Sure. Um, did I not think that the bass was coming to speak? Was I? I don't know. Sorry. Sorry about that, Greg. I'll come back to you. No, I, I thought he was going to, so I, 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 yeah, I thought you, yeah, give okay. way to him okay. uh, and come back in when you're... Good evening, everyone. Uh, I just had a suggestion. I think they covered everything. Um, just, you know, the way a scrutiny is happening is not two-way system. It's just one-way conversation. So whatever we say, we can't come back and say anything. The way, you know, happened with the um, uh, police officer, it needs to be that way so we can respond back and have the conversation and discussion going on. I'm not suggesting, you know, let's have a argument, but if we want it to be more constructive, it needs to be a way we can feed back again and come back again. So that's only my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll go to Greg first. Thank you. I'll just uh, 
um, start. I thought um, David made a rather good point about getting into the numbers um, in uh, his presentation. I think good scrutiny does need to see numbers in the, uh, the reports. Uh, and I think as a matter of principle, it's all very well having um, five or six pages of fine words, but the detail does come from from seeing the um, uh, uh, detailed scrutiny does come from seeing the, the numbers that lie behind it. In terms of the report that we're the scrutiny stock, stock take, um, I think overall it's it's got some uh, some good points in it, and there's a few I'd particularly like to endorse. Uh, it's a pity it hasn't got uh, any kind of referencing in it, but at the bottom of the one to the third page, um, where it talks about committee agendas being shorter and focusing on one or two substan substantive items. Uh, I think that's a really good point, and I think having uh, shorter agendas to allow more detail on a smaller number of subjects uh, and also shorter meetings as a result is also a, a good thing, and therefore the, the way to achieve that is to increase the number of committee meetings per year. And I, I think this is right that we don't have to have an absolutely fixed number. Uh, I think... Um, it, it incorrectly says that the current number is five. I know we've had five or six this year, but actually the Constitution says four, and I think that's, that's the wrong number. I think, I think we should be aiming for five or six, um, and, and we could possibly do seven if they're short. Um, that was, so that's a point I agree with. I think on the next uh, sort of two pages on for that, uh, where it's suggesting that members should conduct a debrief of working group activity since 2019 to build on good practice. Uh, well, I've led three working groups, and I'd be very happy to contribute to that because I think I think we ought to have a best practice guide for how to do working groups. I, th I think overall, yes, the, the the whole thing of evaluating our own, you know our working groups, but also having a tracker of how our recommendations are actually picked up. And implemented. I think all of those things are actually quite positive and that we ought to try and implement them. Uh, well, that was actually my next point, was okay. the master tracker, because I think <coughs> there, I completely agree with that, because there is no point whatsoever in having producing reports that turn into shelfware if, if the recommendations aren't followed up. Um, well, I know, and, and sometimes you might make eight recommendations and two are taken, but you might think, I thought all of them were being taken, but they're not, actually. They are, and, and, and exactly. If we don't have a tracker, you can't go back and, uh, and actually evaluate whether the, the recommendations have actually been taken up or not, even if somebody said fine words about them at the, the point when the report's presented. If, if nobody comes back and does something with them, then... Uh, and, that, and that fits in with, with something David said about, you know, we, we make recommendations, but in the final analysis, are they actually there? We have to, yeah, we have to track, I think. Um, there's one point just going back in the paper that I'm going to disagree with, um, and it's something I had a conversation with Will about, and, uh, but I, I independently agree with him on that. And it's where, in the, on the second page, it proposes, and this isn't personal to you, um, uh, MT, giving the chair of OSC the ultimate power of determination. Yeah. And I would not agree with that and not endorse that, because... You, you exist, Chair, as the expression of the committee, not as an independent power in your own no, no, right. No, that's true, but I mean, having talked to Ed about it, he just that felt that someone had to take more of a lead in it. And it, it, what he felt was that, again, that some chairs were pursuing their own interests and that having, and I think he envisaged it as a kind of a collective thing of the chairs together deciding on, on the work programme. I think there's an expression where I would, it, it, the way it's phrased there, I could not endorse what, what's phrased there. Now, of course, as the chair, you have a coordinating role. It does require, it does imply a degree of informal power um, and exercise in that exercise that, that in exercising that function. Um, but to attribute a formal power in the way this is said, I, 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 I couldn't <laughs> endorse that, but, but I do appreciate, and it, it's not personal to you to saying that you couldn't personally do it or um, you would do it badly, um, but, because but I, don't, it, it, I don't think you would. I, I think it's just that I don't think we could write down that the chair has a power which 
I, I don't think that the chair ca should have the power. I think that the chair is the reflection of the committee's combined agreement. Um, okay, I mean, I, what I would say, Greg, is that I have never actually told anyone what to do, um, nor would wish to, but I think, you see, it is a criticism of me, and the criticism is that I haven't been, as a chair, strong enough to, um, you know, set the... the um, the work program and you know therefore I have to um, I'm not saying I agree 100% with what is said but I have to at least um, analyze it and, and take it on board because the criticism is that I have been too lax and and that the whole um, way that you know, I think that the feeling is that it, it's been too diffuse and there's not enough there isn't really a single work program well I, I don't agree with that. I think it could be uh, it could be a criticism of us as a committee. Uh, I don't think it could be a criticism of you as the chair because you're the expression of the you, you coordinate the committee, you chair us, and you you speak for us when we've had come to an agreed position. I don't. I wouldn't regard what he said as being a criticism of you personally as as chair at all. Um, I would, and I would regard his solution as being giving you a power that you shouldn't have. Uh, albeit that you would possibly exercise some of that power informally. Th those are my views, anyway. Okay. So I'll go to uh, Mo next. What do you think of it? Well, uh, I think I would like to add my voice to what Councillor Hallam said about more details and figures, because uh, no scrutiny without knowing details and comparing figures. We need that, so we can we can work. Uh, we know. We need to differentiate between criticism and scrutiny. And to scrutinize properly, we need to have details and figures. And I would agree on uh, uh, committee agenda should focus on one or two substantive items per agenda. And I think Councillor Ali and uh, Nagy started this very soon. They focus on the uh, committees. They started focusing on one or two items yeah. So it could be criticized, uh, uh, scrutinized much better. So I agree with this. Thank you. Okay. Sarah? Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with what Greg and Mo have said on the figures and also um, you know, just generally on um, scrutiny, having come back. Um, just one thing to David is that um, I think this has obviously been a very difficult time with COVID and scrutiny has not been able to go out and do the visits, no, which I do true. think is a really, really important part of scrutiny. Um, particularly, I mean, for me, for adult social care, going to some of the care homes, some of the places where we have people who have learning disabilities or disabilities, and just really seeing what's, what, you know, who we're looking after is really, really important. So I think hopefully David will see, see some of us in the future. <laughs> Um, with, for adult social care and health, I think it came up at our meeting the other day. It's such a big area. It's not just adult social care, public health, but it's also health. And whilst it's really important to have a small number of items on the agenda, a number of the committee members felt that we should still have a lead members report just to highlight some of the issues, some of the things that the lead member is looking at whether it's complaints, whether it's about um, care homes, home care, whatever it is, but just to highlight a few issues. If it's a report that's just distributed between meetings, the public won't see that. Can, can I ask, Jackie, could you, you say something about that? Because, you know, the, the idea is, um, and we are charged, we, we are expected to change and move forward, and this is part of the review of governance, and the idea being that those kind of, what we used to have, the roundup reports from the lead members is, is old hat and we shouldn't be doing it. But I haven't probably expressed that very well, so I'm going to ask um, Jackie to say something. Yeah, of course. I think the thing is that because it's such a big area, we don't know a lot of the things that are going on. So we're not actually scrutinizing that report. It's just highlighting what, what's happening, and maybe we can take something, something from that report and say, this is what we really need to look at. But without that, we don't know what's going on. We spent the whole of the last meeting on the NHS. 
we haven't looked at anything that the council's doing. And I think it, it, it's, it's an area that I feel in, in adult social care and public health is really important that we, we really need to see more of what's going on. Sorry, Jackie. Okay, well, if councillors want, in, if, sorry, microphone, if councillors want information, of course you should have it, because you are the councillors. But um, I think I would link it back to the statutory guidance and also the first recommendation in this or action proposed in the stock take. So the statutory guidance does say very clearly that there's lots of things that scrutiny could look at and it really emphasises prioritisation and that some things are important but you still won't be able to look at them. But to link it back to your point, if you don't know what's going on, you don't know what's important. So um, I think it's about distinguishing the information that you want and you should have and then what goes on a committee agenda. So you could still get information from the lead member. So if they're willing to do a report, you can get that. It can still be put in the public domain. And then you can use that to refine what you want on your agenda to actually scrutinise. Um, so I've been talking to my colleague um, in the scrutiny team about um, how we can get better information. So what um, councillors Hammond and Bakhtiar have both said about the quality of information. So we've been having discussions on the back of the stock take about how we can support you as members and get more information for you and put it somewhere where you can access it sort of IT wise or whatever and sort of to link it more to adult social care and health I mean that committee does have a huge terms of reference because it's not just looking at the council it's looking at what's happening in the NHS the partnership working and there is so much um, for that committee to do so what I'm trying to say is we'll look at the information that you want and then, as councillors, you'll have to look at what needs to go on your agenda, but what you should have access to anyway. But I do agree, if councillors want information, of course, they should have it. Can, can I just go back to when I was doing the public realm? Um, we would have agendas which are about 12, 13 items long. Every time, we would have um, reports from, it was the two Tims, uh, for, you know, from each of their departments, and I was constantly told um, that uh, the officers require you to look at this report, that report, the other report. So all that scrutiny was really doing was kind of shadowing what the lead members were doing. It wasn't doing any independent work of its own. I struggled to get anything on the agenda at all because I was told I had to have X, Y, Z reports every single time. There was no discussion. Uh, you know, I'd go to agenda setting me meetings and I would be told what would be on my agenda. And, and so th that's really what we're trying to get away from. We're trying to get away from, uh, from that kind of system where we shadow the leadership team, whereby we are doing something more dynamic. And I think to do that, we do need to prioritize. I think we do need to have fewer items. I think that's essential. It's obvious that y if you have two or three things on the agenda, you can have m a much better um, system but you know you always have to kind of pinch yourself and say yeah but what difference did it make right and I would say the way we used to do things in the past and I'm probably the only one now who was a, a scrutiny chair in that distant time past I don't think we achieved very much at all and I would do a working group and I'd have eight recommendations and I'd be told I could have one or maybe a half and that's just how it was and what we're trying to do is that scrutiny, you know, it's not a question of me setting the agenda, but I think what they want from the, the Centre for Scrutiny and Governance, whatever it's called now, is they want scrutiny to set its own agenda, to decide its priorities, and to get on with it. And I think that's what they feel is lacking, that there has been quite a lot of drift, and there's a kind of sort of ebb and a flow of going back to the old ways of working. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just saying that because I know in the past just how hamstrung I was and not really able to do anything. And I don't really think, I, you know, I, I did it for four years and I'd be hard pushed to say what I'd actually achieved at the end of it. So going back to, you know, shadowing lead members, to me, I 
you know, as Jackie says, if you want the information, you can have it, but I don't think it's going to be a good idea. So it's not really shadowing the lead member, it's, it's finding out, so if there's big, you know, public health, adult social care have big contracts, commissioning contracts, and I think if we knew something was coming up, which we do now, we know that the home care is coming up, is that we can get involved early and help them rather than just it being presented to us and saying, well, here you are, this is what we've, we've done. Um, it's how we get in early. We did it on passenger transport, which I think will probably be coming up again soon. Um, and I think there's, there's a number of contracts there, zero to five, again, that, that changed dramatically over COVID. I mean, they completely transformed what they were going to do. But I think it's, it's how, how can we get in early? And if we don't know what's coming up, they're setting the work program in a sense tonight and people have picked three or four whatever areas of interest so I mean even though there has to be you know a certain amount of flexibility in case something else comes up as we go a lot like COVID or something but I mean you know what what, what are these the, the point this is what they're trying this is what the Centre for Governance and Scrutiny wants us to do is to think about it and to think about what's the important things, to prioritise it, to focus on it, and to, to go ahead with that work programme. And that's what we're being asked to do. Brett. Thank you, MT. I, I think the, um, your insights into your experiences on public realm were very interesting. Um, and it is absolutely not the experience that we've had in the last year. Certainly what I can say on housing is the last year we chose a a work That's program true. and it was agreed and, uh, and we've been through it and uh, we've got a list tonight which I hope this committee will endorse and it's our list and, uh, and of course there would be some overlap if the leadership um, or the officers chose the subjects because um, we've probably focused on some of the, import the very important areas and they focused on, they would focus on the things that they're doing and there will be overlap in, in that uh, and so there should be. But um, the list is our choice, and, and I think that's what we did last year. Uh, yes. And I can't really speak for the other committees, yes. but, but as collectively on the OSC, if we're yeah. doing that for all four committees, then so we are choosing the work program, and we're setting it collectively as the OSC. So we're on the right track. We, we, we can always do it better for the, in some of the ways that we talked about in the report. So all but we're a million miles away from what you described on the, um, the experience of the public but realm for those years ago when you were told what your agenda was. Yes, and, and, and that's good, but I'm just bringing up this was the past and that's what we have to get away from, and I agree, and I think the report itself does say that there has been improvement, but it says there is still further to go. Madam Chair, uh, yeah. could I say something, since my name's been mentioned, there's two, two particular points before I get on to what I think about the report. Firstly, I think the the, the the line that you took, that the, the um, point about the authority of the chairman was a criticism view. I, I, I really do not accept that at all. The point that I discussed with Councillor Hammond was nothing to do with you personally. It was to do that I think it's totally wrong constitutionally to have that power um, uh, written into the, what, what is a recommendation that we either accept or that we don't. Okay. And, and I, can I please finish? Because I haven't been able to speak. The, the other thing that, 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 I, that I wanted to say is that there is a solution to this question of whether we deal with the uh, lead members' things on a regular basis or not. I think what we could do as, a, as, as this committee and also as the select committees is to put a list of questions or subject areas that we wish to be tracked by our support officers, that we be informed about that information in between meetings in the way that Greg Hammond has recommended that we take we take information between meetings rather than at meetings. But the change here from what's been discussed previously is that we actually record those, those briefings in the minutes of the meeting as reports that have been read as background information by the members of the committee and that we make it available as a, as a link in the minutes so that that information can be accessed by anybody, public or otherwise, who's, who's interested in that information. Now, that, that's a technique which we've already started to develop with um, Jackie and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and our, our support officer. And we will be using that technique in our 
in our, end of, in our reporting work as well. So that there's a shorter report, there are less items on the, on the, on the agenda for the meetings, there's more information available to um, members of the, of the committees that can be taken in the meetings, which makes those meetings focus on the scrutiny that Ed Hammond has recommended in his report. But that extra information that's provided, that background information is provided as a bibliography recorded as items in the, agenda, uh, items in the minutes of the meeting with an electronic link. So full access to that discussion and, and reporting can be, can be drilled into by any member of the committee or public or other, other councillors as they wish. But we do take on board Ed Hammond's recommendation of making the, the meetings themselves have a smaller number of items on the agenda. Okay, so what I would say the criticism is, is this, that um, he states in the report that some chairmen are pursuing their own interests and not looking at, you know, something that is important to them. That's what it, that's what it says, and that is why he would like us to have a single work program so that that doesn't happen. And that, you know, I'm not saying I agree with it, but I'm, that is what is stated in the report, and that is what is said. And because that is what is said, therefore we have to consider it, whether we like it or not. The point that I'm making. The point I'm making is that I agree with having a single work program that we discussed together as this committee. I agree with that. But the two points that I was making was one, that the chairman of OSC, not you personally, the chairman of OSC should not have institutionalized power to decide over the OSC or, or the other committees as to what should happen. It should be a consensus, and the duty of the chairman should be to establish a consensus, and the duty of the committee should be to discuss and balance the, in, the, the veracity of the items to be, to be scrutinized so that it doesn't just take into account personal uh, but the, the reason it is put in the stock take is because Ed feels that hasn't happened in all of the committees. That is the reason he's put it in. Individual points with individual committees mm. and okay. actually substantiate his points because I think generically this has been put in a bad way. I think the objective and I think what he's put in is I don't read his, his report in that way and I think that one of the things I wanted to say, if I could, on this a reaction to this report, other people having spoken at least once, is that um, I would accept his report in, 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 in virtually in entirety, apart from this constitutional point of the power of the chairman, and that I would also praise our scrutiny officer, Jackie, for putting very succinctly in item 2.2 the actions out of Ed Hammond's report that we need to put into, into effect, because those I would accept as well. So I accept the report, and I accept the principle that we have a, co a collective approval of the work, one work program rather than individual chairman's picadillos or whatever it happens to be. Um, but I don't accept the constitutional wording that he's put in his report. I think put differently, it could be very, very, uh, very useful and, 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 and help. But I think it is constitutionally wrong that the chairman should have the final say. Okay. Janet, I'd like to bring Janet in here. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of things. We are a different scrutiny system now. We have moved on. In fact, three of the chairs of the scrutiny committees are new councillors. Right. We are here with a new mentality. Um, there are some benefits uh, to what Ed Hammond recommended, and this also brings into account what David O'Connell mentioned uh, with regard to Grenfell, because as one of the things Ed Hammond said is that if we go too broad, we won't get anything done, and I agree with that. We have now a, a system where we are addressing Grenfell in each committee. So we are covering housing, adult social services, environment, and family and children's services. In this way, we are satisfying that it's joined up in this regard, and we are also effectively looking at different aspects of Grenfell. So I think it's a very good way of doing it. 
and um, I really approve of that. So in this regard, with our scrutiny of Grenfell, we are satisfying what Ed Hammond recommended, in my opinion. Um, we have also the opportunity to investigate key decisions, because that we have addressed, and we do need more information. And um, so that does follow up uh, and addresses one of the points that uh, David O'Connell mentioned. And it has been brought up by the chairs. And uh, we have been asking for more information. And indeed, on several key decisions, I've we've called meetings. Each committee has called meetings with officers to get more information. So it is a very important point, and we are doing that. So those are the two points that I'd like to add to whatever uh, my colleagues have said. Thank you, Janet. So, and I think you're doing a very good job, actually. <laughs> Marwan, what do you think of uh, the stock take? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it's, I mean, as been said, um, it's um, it's giving a one year a view for uh, for an experiment which we are conducting now with this current setting, um, and I will accept the report. I mean, in term, in not in details, but in term of totality. Um, on the way we are approaching scrutiny um, and remembering that um, um, the Grenfell issues um, to make it more integrated. I mean, we are discussing different things um, in different committees, um, allow, giving more chance for other stakeholders to have an input into that process is still in the early stages to make final judgment. Um, we are doing uh, our best in terms of um, filtering through what uh, needs to be scrutinized. I do accept that um, it should not be an information platform. Um, we should be focusing in more details, as Councillor Hammond said, supported by my other colleagues, uh, uh, Councillor Adenbrook and uh, Councillor Bakhtiar, highlighted eloquently by um, Councillor Wells, um, Councillor Pascal, um, on bringing the, all the issues together. So uh, we need, we need uh, more time to reflect uh, in order to really substantiate all the data, especially the quality data, which we require from our officers. Um, and, and this is a critical. And as Jackie just highlighted, that uh, there is no excuse uh, for any officers if we request uh, uh, data uh, or information that should be made available to us. And we should be supported in that process because for our to rely um, on uh, decision making, you need to rely on quality data. And having per meeting two items, which I really strive to achieve over the last year. Um, and not only that, but involving other stakeholders like uh, academics. We should not be, uh, or maybe government officials uh, next because it's a holistic approach to our scrutiny for our local government in order to make the right decision um, in alignment with government policy. So, so that's really um, um, the opening up for, uh, for our work. Um, and that's why I, I'm, I'm wholeheartedly, I'm going to accept this. And now our response uh, should be in line of what worked, what did not work, and um, and this is uh, the the way forward. Um, so can, yeah, thank can, you. Chair. Can I just raise one more thing, which I think is probably the most important thing before we move on? That a, a, a lot of the um, 
It's about culture as well as detail, and as well as constitution and, and et cetera. And the, the main sort of thrust of the argument from Ed is, is the need to work in a way which he calls pluralistic. In other words, cross-party, lots of voices, everyone coming together. And I think that we have made an effort to do that, to, to, to hear other people's um, voices to let residents come in. We've been hampered by COVID to an extent. We haven't been able to have like a, we used to have a day event where people could come in and give their ideas about what they wanted us to scrutinize for a conference. We haven't been able to do that. But I just wondered um, how, because you know, I'll put it to the Labour councillors now, because you were out for it, how, how you have felt about coming in <coughs> and working, you know, in a, in a cross-party way um, in, in scrutiny, because my personal feeling is it, scrutiny has to be cross-party, but I just wondered what you felt about it. Um. It's, we've been given the chance to, to uh, make uh, our um, voice uh, and, uh, and be the voice of our residents. Um, so um, th th there is no uh, doubt that uh, uh, we've made the effort to, to work together for the benefits of our uh, community and our residents. They are our residents. And the uh, party politics should n not be there. Uh, now we are working all together as one council. And that's how I see it. That's how I believe in it. And uh, we work together for the best and the best interests of our residents. So having uh, today uh, our residents who are um, vocal, uh, well informed, and we are grateful to their time to come here to articulate the concern of, uh, of residents and giving their time uh, to, uh, to inform us and to let us know what we don't know uh, in that immediate community, uh, what they are facing. So they share that uh, information with us and they are actually a, a key part in that scrutiny process. So uh, the same as other stakeholders. Um, and that's why uh, we are giving uh, their platforms um, to, to incorporate their views um, with no fear of that open criticism, because I believe um, this is a way forward uh, for transparency, for accountability, and when we ask lead members to be present, giving um, any justification for that um, decision, that has to be uh, properly articulated and quantified so we can make an appropriate um, uh, criticism or scrutiny for that decision making because that's what we are here for, to scrutinize that decision making process for the best outcome. That's okay. what I believe. Mo, do you want to say anything? <coughs> The, the reality is we had a new arrangements for scrutiny. We opposed to the new system and we still believe that uh, having a special scrutiny for Greenfield altogether is the best way forward. But the reality is there is a new way. We have to, as uh, Councillor Anagi said, we are trying, we are representing our communities, we are trying to work with what is available in front of us. But uh, uh, transparency is the key. We have to have, not only us, our residents must have the figures, the numbers, whatever is available. So they know, uh, there is a say in legal terms says, uh, all those who come to equity must come in clean hands. So we have to show everything. The council should show all figures shared with everyone. Nothing sh should be hidden. Thank you. Thanks, Mo. So <clears throat> I think we'll move on now to the individual work programs. And I think... Probably what Ed was really getting at was that the other chairs could make, or members of the committee could make comments on the choices that people have made. I think that was really the point that he was making. 
Um, but anyway, so I will start with the OSC. So OSC, there are a lot of things we have to do, which is what we had to do tonight, which was crime and disorder. Um, we are doing what we're doing now. We're overall responsible for delivering scrutiny, which is what we're trying to do now. Um, we also have to do the annual state of the borough. Um, we look at the strategic items on Grenfell, and we have um, the budget working group. Um, another thing that just occurred to me, and I don't know what's happened to it, is we were having, reporting to us, a group, um, the Earl's Court councillors were going to um, submit a report to us, and I don't know what's happened. Um, so those are my suggestions for OSC. I don't know if I've left anything out or if anyone <coughs> wants to um, add anything. Yeah. Could, could I um, say something? That, um, one of the, I think the, having the um, financial working group in OSC is absolutely essential. One of the things that um, I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure how it works yet, and I've been on this scrutiny for a year and a bit, um, and I've been on scrutiny before, and I've certainly witnessed where scrutiny did work well in the past, and it didn't work well in the past. So I think you're right, the progress has been made, but good progress, good things did happen then uh, as well. But the point on the financials is that, um, it, I mean, I would only speak for our, for our committee, but over the last year, um, we've been involved in several circumstances where there have been uh, big programs of work to achieve big technical results, insulating the housing stock, changing the, the heating systems, such like, um, which have had a big influence on the amount of budget needed in that sector in the council. Now, I have had conversations with audit and transparency and established uh, items on the risk register, which weren't there before, but I haven't yet had conversations with our working group, financial working group in OSC. So maybe that's something that we as an ESC need to look at. Um, and, well, and that the working work group is chaired by Adrian. Yes. And um, we are actually going to try, and we're meant to be arranging a meeting at the moment. So there'll be, there'll be uh, working, there'll be work between that group he chairs and the select committees for discussing the areas which well, are I mean, my own feeling is, is when, when I first took this on, I was actually amazed that nobody wanted to do their own budget. And, you know, I actually think if you do want to do your own budget, I, I actually can't think of a reason why you shouldn't. But we, it makes sense to have a working group looking at it as a whole. Yeah? But um, I, I think if you want to look into your budget or how we do it, I think that's open for discussion. I think the, um, the, the point I'm making is that where we come across an exceptional event, like, for instance, the budget for providing the um, insulation, the reglazing, and the new boilers in the 9,000 housing stock, social housing stock the council has, that, that we had reports from officers to uh, how much that would cost. We then asked officers as to whether this was, in, it was actually included in the council's budget or projections medium term financial strategy. We received the answers no. We asked for that information to be passed to Adrian's group by, you know, by officers who were informing his group and we're not certain that it, that it has been. And I just want to know what mechanism that you envisage as chair of this committee for that to happen. Should we be doing it via our officers, via our scrutiny chairs? Should we be participate in a working group with Adrian's committee? No, I, what, I don't have an answer to it. I just need to know what, how you would like it done. What I'm saying is, is Adrian is chairing that working group, and so he decides how that working group works, not me. But if in your own individual committee, Will, you would like to look at your budget, I see no reason why you, why you can't do that. that, that that's not the point I'm making is, is if we discover something in our select committee that he's not aware of, how should we transmit it to him? I mean, I can ring him up and go and have coffee or something, but I think there ought to be a, 
I, I mean, I, I personally feel that there ought to be a duty of each select committee to identify, or if they come, if they do identify an area which is exceptional to the budget, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the odd bit here and there probably doesn't matter, but where there's a structural weakness in the budget provision that's identified in a report from a financial officer. I'm going to bring in, in Jackie now. I, I do, Jackie. Hopefully I can help with this. Um, there's a, going back to the report we just looked at, Ed's report, he suggested that recommendations were all consolidated in a report to this committee, the overview committee. So these are recommendations coming out of your select committee will. So I'm talking to officers about getting that tracker for your overview meeting in September. So you would bring it to overview so this committee is aware because the budget working group reports in here and Councillor Bell Cox. Councillor Beryl Cox can pick it up through that. Would that suit you to do it that way? I, I can see that that's a good all-round sweep, but I think that, for instance, where we were told by an officer there was a hundred million pounds shortfall in a particular area and no clear way of raising that finance. I think when I identified that to the, to the um, uh, Audit and Transparency Committee, the chairman there made sure that it was on the risk register as a major risk for the council. Now. That was done as an informal process because I, I got in touch with him direct to do that. Should I be using the same informal approach to Adrian Barrow Cox and his group, or should it be a duty of all our four select committees to report any major variances from budget that we identify in our work to, that, to, to, the, to the Adrian Barrow Cox's group? I think it should be institutionalized in, our, in a role. If we identify something that is, if it, in effect, wrong, we should pass it on to the group that no, is actually working on it. If you would like to look at, have a paper on, you know, the budget of your area, then you can have that. And if you would like to feed that into Adrian's group, you can. In the past, what we did is we had um, uh, an afternoon, I think we had two afternoons, where we had all the people, the finance people, all came in and the... Um, uh, the, the chairs came in for their kind of section of it. That's what we did in the past, isn't it? I think that's a, that's a very good idea. And I think we didn't do it this... Did we do it this year? Was, was it because of COVID or whatever? No, we, we did do it this year. Um, it was done in November. Yeah. So um, there's a draft project plan for the budget working group that will probably come here as part of your work programme in September. But and in that draft, it does have doing those sessions again. And I'm sure that... Well, the sorry, I, I wasn't aware that there was a session in November which I participated in with Adrian Burrow-Cox going through the, the well, budget of ESC. There was a... Um, the and, budget and, and in any case, the, if the information was found out in December, um, you know, we need a way... I mean, what I'm asking for is if there's a... It's a very simple thing, and I can't see the difficulty of asking for this. I mean, if everybody disagrees, they all disagree, and I'll shut up. But I think that if, basically, if... Select committee finds out that there is a major deficit, or surplus for that matter, in a budgetary provision in their area of competence, um, be it adult social care or, 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 or housing communities. That if a, if a major area is found, that should be reported to immediately to the chairman of the OSC finance group, and he will then decide what he will do with it in his committee. But the report, the duty to report, should be there. or you could look at it and bring it here yourself. But, I mean, there's no point arguing. We, we might as well just carry on. So moving on to the next committee, should we do Janet's next? Janet. Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to say that we have, this year, we've been very busy looking at key decisions and where we have flagged up uh, certain queries, and we've dealt with it directly uh, with Jackie and with my officer Paula and Catherine Loma. So I thank everybody for their help with that, in including the joint committee meeting uh, with officers that you uh, put together for family services and adult social care and health. And that was very, very helpful because we had queries on the early child offer and. Um, it, it had uh, questions that affected two select committees. So that was very fruitful. Um, 
We also have, uh, we had a very good session on support for families during COVID-19, and uh, we had, it went very long, that meeting, but we got a lot of information out there, and we had a lot of feedback from the community, so I was happy with that. Um, what we are, my committee voted on to go ahead with, this is our short list, but it still has to be modified. Uh, we've decided to work with SEND, uh, Special Education Needs and Disabilities, for one working group. I, we are, will be doing serious youth violence. In fact, we have an, another uh, report coming from a working group about domestic abuse during COVID within families and violence domestic violence. We have an ongoing commitment to do children safeguarding in the borough, and we bring in experts from the field. And this is something that we have a statutory duty to do as well, and we bring it in every year. And we have still dis not decided on the Grenfell recovery related topic. Uh, we have decided, of course, that we are doing our ongoing commitment to exploring Grenfell, and I welcome the community to give their ideas as well, because we will be thinking about it during the summer and discussing it at our September meeting. But any aspect that you think which will affects your community, families and children, we would be very happy to look at. Um, as I said, we feel it is effective to look at different aspects of Grenfell at each meeting or on each agenda during the year because it's such a vast topic and there's so much to look at. So from the Family and Children's Services, we welcome the community input. And um, I thank again the officers for their excellent work and support. Thank you, Janet. Does anyone have any comments about your work program? So I'll go to um, Greg, if you could, um, because, um, Kasim's not here tonight, so uh, thank you. Housing has come up with chair, and um, Kasim did uh, delegate me the uh, task of uh, presenting what our committee discussed on the 24th of June, uh, and we are proposing the following five um, major topics to uh, to discuss this year, um, plus some follow-ups from last year. Uh, and a couple of other things. So the new topics, or the, the major topics, firstly, um, the housing and communities aspect of Grenfell Recovery, uh, recognising, of course, that this committee uh, covers the strategic elements uh, of, of Grenfell. Uh, secondly, COVID recovery, and that's the communities aspects of COVID recovery, and in particular, food insecurity, and again, recognising that this committee um, covers the strategic uh, elements of, of this uh, matter. The third one uh, is the new homes program um, and including the theme of placemaking and housing supply more generally. Fourth one, uh, and this is a completely new one that we didn't do in any form last year, is the management of temporary accommodation. Mm -hmm. uh, fifth one, the repairs and capital program, which we have actually had on our agenda for the 24th of June meeting already. Uh, and then there are uh, a number of um, follow-ons from last year. So we have a uh, we will uh, do a response from the lead member to the working group report on housing safety and healthy homes that we tabled and was accepted last year. Um, but we do need to see the, the leadership team's response to the recommendations, and that will take time in one of our committee meetings. Uh, we're also expecting a response from the lead member to the previous year's modular housing working group and there are a couple of other follow-ups on on that which the committee collectively agreed to to do that won't take a huge amount of time third one uh, we would expect the registered providers forum um, that the council established last year to have one public session during the course of this year which we would expect as the housing select committee or select committee to join um, and then finally, uh, we had a very good report last year on fire and building safety, um, and we would expect an update on that, but also we would be wanting to go out on some visits this year, 
uh, and they would be an opportunity in particular to fill up, uh, to follow up the uh, subject of building safety. Um, and uh, we, we would, of course, propose to do the annual uh, scrutiny of the two lead members. Uh, and I think, uh, and then uh, finally to mention that there are a number of key decisions coming out, um, in particular in the housing domain uh, this year that we will need to spend some time scrutinising. Um, have you thought at all what you might be doing a working group on? Have you got that far? Or is that with CASM now? Or yeah, um, we were... We didn't come to a conclusion on the title, but uh, as a committee, we talked about um, having a working group with a communities theme. Mm -hmm. But what we haven't got is a title, uh, a particular subject to explore, or the membership of that proposed working group nailed down. But that was the okay. that was the thinking. That was certainly Kasim's um, conception that he put to the committee, and I don't think there was. A, there wasn't really any dissent from it, but but there was no um, nobody had actually sort of thought about what the uh, what the topic that could be um, scrutinised in detail by that working group could be. So that hasn't been bottomed out yet. Okay, that's fine. Marwan. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the what uh, what we did uh, at the last uh, workshop i mean uh, as um, part of our work is to keep the agenda items as small and as focused and rich as possible um, so what's being confirmed is uh, we are keeping the safeguarding adult report uh, and topic related to grandfather recovery strategy the uh, element of the working group that was set up uh, last year on mental health in North Kensington in particular uh, to continue, uh, that was chaired by uh, Councillor Williams uh, and with members with uh, Councillor uh, Atkinson and Councillor Idris and uh, Councillor Edinburgh. We agreed that uh, hopefully this will continue. Um, the scope might be uh, to include um, the transition of uh, young people with mental health uh, from the children's services to adult services. Um, and um, the group as well um, reported some consideration aspects uh, to be given for reviewing the special education needs um, in that uh, process. The, um, during the year, um, members uh, will uh, also continue to scrutinize uh, key decision um, that being put uh, forward by the council uh, that will fall within our terms uh, and uh, reference for the committee. And it was agreed uh, that uh, the lead member um, for uh, other social care and health, uh, Councillor Kamali, will be continuing to be invited um, to the meetings uh, and where members, as well as member of the public, will be given the opportunity uh, to uh, ask questions um, and present their views. Uh, on the uh, at the meeting as well, um, where we are challenged uh, that the challenges being faced by home care um, to be included, especially as uh, Councillor Will uh, Pascal highlighted, uh, uh, where we discuss the public health budget and its outcomes. That's, uh, this is uh, being considered as uh, an important uh, topic to be included uh, in this area of this work program. Um, hopefully, the, uh, this uh, work uh, will be supported by um, our scrutiny manager and her team um, to be carried 
in details. Um, and um, and all the um, what's been mentioned by the director of integrated commissioning, um, Gareth uh, I think Gareth Wall. Um, that's uh, he will be uh, recalled. That's uh, he offered to invite the committee at an early stage of home care discussion. So that will be involved at the early stages of that development for to provide monitoring information. So that will be um, a factor uh, into our project plan. And as uh, Councillor Adenbrook uh, highlighted uh, to our residents, uh, hopefully the lockdown will be over by then during this, uh, this year where we will be making um, a group or working group visits to some of the home cares to get first-hand experience uh, of uh, what's going on in terms of uh, um, the COVID recovery uh, that's affecting our uh, social care uh, homes. And that's uh, my conclude, uh, thank my you. comments, uh, thank Chair. You. Thank you. Well. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, firstly, I'd like to um, point to the welcome that we as a committee are giving to Ed Hammond's report, as we discussed previously, and in particular to Jackie uh, Hurd's summary of the immediate actions, some of which we've implemented already in our committee in reducing the number of items on the committees. We've also um, made a major progress in, in taking big technical papers offline, if you like, out of, out of the scrutiny meetings and taking them into a briefing meeting, but reintegrating them back into the scrutiny process by referencing them in the minutes. And the particular example I'd draw to your attention with the minutes of a meeting we had recently, which will soon be out, will be to a report called Ether, which is an academically based operation in Oxford that is giving the background to the numbers of the job that the council is going to have to face with regard to it, both its 2030 and its 2040 commitments on climate change. And uh, Greg, if you want numbers, there are 120 pages of them, and I think you recommend you have coffee before you start reading them. Um, one of the uh, things also from Ed Hammond's stock take community um, is to listen more to communities and it's been extremely difficult in our uh, particular case um, to, to do that during the COVID time. But we have started at this last meeting uh, to change the culture of that by inviting uh, in both the Chelsea and the Kensington societies, which are the biggest uh, amenities societies in the borough, but also have member uh, residents associations and amenity societies covering the, uh, most of the borough um, from the north to to, to the south, uh, and th they form the basis. I mean, I think one um, local one in, in the south, which goes from uh, say some of the posh bits of Sloan Square through to the lesh posh, posh bits of, of um, World's End, um, and there are, there's an organisation called Cracker, which is um, has 32 or is it 33 um, residents associations that belong to that, um, and they feed into the Chelsea Society and into our um, you know, discussions in, in the future. We've already had them at this last meeting when we started talking about the London plan. Um, we want to do more of that and go on visits. And one that we've identified last year that we were unable to do, we were asked by officers whether we'd like to visit Lancaster West um, because I think the, uh, the area of work there that is tackling environmental issues in the refurbishment there is a leading example, not just in the borough, but beyond the borough as well, technically and otherwise, and particular emphasis on the involvement of the local community. So if I may ask if our community, if our committee could come and visit and listen to some of the issues on the environmental side. We're not getting involved in, in the other aspects of things because we're an environment committee, not, not, uh, not OSC. So coming back to our work plan, um, the topics that we have uh, identified We've identified three topics for this year. The first one, and the, and the one that's been identified as the most important by our members and consulting outside, 
is the development of the local plan because the local plan is the key document which is used um, in planning decisions that reflects both the wishes of the uh, community within the borough, the policies of the, uh, the borough, which I suppose is summarised by our council plan 2019-23, which has been upgrade, up, up, uh, updated recently. Um, and it, but it also reflects, uh, as is required by legislation, the, the London plan, the planning white paper, and the emerge, emerging um, uh, COP uh, policy, COP being the, new, the uh, conference that's coming up in Glasgow, the worldwide conference on, on climate change. Um, so the question then becomes, how does this drafting, which will happen during the autumn, um, align with RBKC's policies, including carbon zero, biodiversity trees, community gardens, etc.? And how does it balance the conflicting requirements of housing delivery, density and height, conservation areas, and sustainable communities. Um, the key thing to take up the point that the chairman made about being cr a cross-party was probably the most valuable contribution made in our last um, Environment Select Committee was made by Pat Mason, um, pointing out that the uh, lead member had mentioned that the options, issues and options consultation that's going to happen over the next three months is the time at which, if you like, the, the brief will be written for the script which will be developed during the autumn of the draft of the local plan which will be going forward for approval in the spring next year. So by the time that, that brief has been written, what is going to go into the considerations of the local plan will have been sifted to a, to a degree. So it's vital that the select committee and outside it bodies f via us make contributions into that consultation during the next three months. So the, that's the priority that we've got to face with our uh, um scrutiny support officers. The second area um, was identified was the continuing work from last year on what we've called street management, which is a grouping of many of the things in the long list which came for us to discuss. Um, to, but the key point there is how the often uh, good but isolated services that the council produces, ranging from noise and nuisance to wardens to um, environmental services, etc how those become better integrated, that the integration that's already happened, the good progress that's been made by Crest is further broadened to include uh, wardens and also the integration of um, councillors, uh, councillor, um, sorry, council uh, customer services and get rid of that last S and change the culture into council uh, customer service rather than services. So they reflect a customer-centric view of the world rather than a council-centric view of the world. And they make access easy. One of the reports we had from our residents and their societies was that it's often easier to access the website via Google than it is via the front portal of the website. Um, and that, that culture has got to change. Um, so the third area um, is carbon net zero 2040. 2030 is what we looked at last year, which is the council's own operations, including those that it commissions. And we will have some updates on that this year in report writing. But the focus will now change to an outward-looking um, borough-wide 2040 objective so that it's, it needs to include domestic... And just to go to the side, the reason we consulted Ether in a briefing was because this was a highly technical briefing to help us as a committee identify those areas of scrutiny which will have real impact in terms of scale, realistic achievements within the period, cost effectiveness, um, response to uh, community needs, etc. Um, and then dealing from a whole wide range of things from air quality uh, through um, general pollution, uh, through fuel poverty, um, through to uh, the ability of the getting the different sectors in the council to, uh, and, sorry, in the borough to, to achieve carbon zero by 2040. And broadly speaking, that's now been divided down into do domestic buildings, which will obviously include housing associations, registered providers, private rental, and are occupied. Um, conservation areas um, area include problems to do with heat pumps uh, and double glazing. Uh, it may sound details, but they're, they're going to things that are going to stop it happening if, if we don't re get resolved. Uh, I had a uh, a, a resident recently have a, a very um, uh, climate change 
cognizant conversion on their building turned down because the housing, um, sorry, the planning conservation officer would not allow double glazing in a, res in a conservation area. Um, and this has got to be resolved. We've got to involve um, English heritage and such bodies to help us get through this roadblock um, because it's a real challenge. But we can't have one part of the planning department saying we've got to get green, and on the other hand, another part saying you can't get green in a conservation area when 70% of the borough is in conservation area. It's just something that's got to be got past. Um, and we've got to find a way, we've got to encourage lead members and officers to redouble their efforts and to address the issue directly and report back to us as to how they're going to achieve it and in sufficient time to get the change to carbon 40, 2040 happening at the right pace and, and cadence. The third area under carbon net zero is transport. Um, it's always been seen in the borough to be the first and most important area, but actually it's very small compared with the building related issues both within the council and, and, and within the borough. Uh, under transport, passenger and goods services. My amazement is that how few cars we've got and how many white vans we've now got. And if we just focus on cars and not on white vans, we're missing a trick. Um, it's to do with uh, goods and services and the demand for transport post-COVID. If we all work from home, we won't necessarily need quite as much transport to go to work. And the influence of the increased uh, fibre to the premises um, of the internet and the shift of different kinds of uh, transport mode and the shift to uh, carbon-free electric vehicles, for instance, um, and, and so on. I, I, I share Councillor Bakhtiar's scepticism with regard to e-scooters, um, um, but they, they, in some senses, are a very efficient way of getting about. Um, so we'll have to see how that trial works and learn the lessons from that. Follow-ups from 2021, uh, as I said, a visit to Lancaster West, if we're allowed to come, would be, if we would be welcome, would be very much something we would welcome to learn the lessons from yourselves as community as well as from the technical officers um, on the refurbishment, the heat network, and also the passive house ex experiment that is happening up there because they are, as I say, exemplars uh, that are up with the same standards as being done by other institutions uh, in housing across the borough and also wider in, in London and, and outside. Um, I think the uptake of the... Um, 2030 carbon zero scrutiny recommendations through the tracker is going to be something that we're working with Jackie on. And this is not something we'll spend a lot of uh, select committee time on in the public meetings, but we will report on it and keep, keep track of, of what's happening. And then we will also, as others have said, um, look at the key decisions the, from the forward plan. So that's what I'm uh, asked by my committee to represent to you for approval by this committee. Thank you. So I think we'll move on now to the next um, item on the agenda, um, which is the key decisions. Oh, sorry. Okay, I guess so, but it has to be quickly, because it's getting late, um, Kimia. Yeah, okay. And then we'll do KDs. We just thank you very much and we just want to say obviously it's a long evening so we don't want to keep you and we're volunteers we do all of this because it's important that we do i don't know exactly where you are in the process or where you're having your debate or anything forgive me i don't i'm never really interacted with councils before this but there's just one thing on the, in this report it says there's no straightforward from ed hammond there is no straightforward structure or solution to effective oversight of Grenfell-related matters. It is an issue of trust. And while trust in the council by parts of the community, the Grenfell community and Lancaster West community and the wider community in North Kensington, remains at an extremely low ebb, we recognize that it will be extremely challenging to secure a way forward. And what I found interesting listening to the debate that you were all having was that... Um, 
um, Councillor Janet Evans co made a comment um, which I found remarkable, really, in a sort of the head in the sand attitude that I think needs to really change uh, where and has no place anymore going forward because, um, and we don't have any time or appetite for it anymore. But Councillor Janet Evans said that. Um, you know, everything was much better and going very well. And in fact, there are three new councillors who are chairs of the, the scrutiny and everything is, is that much better. When in fact, we have experience of what happened at, the, at, the, at a Grenfell education uh, meeting that we attended, the scrutiny meeting. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, it, re it revealed many important issues. And Josh Rendell said that he would do more consultation, et cetera, but before putting forward the recommendations. Never did that, despite the fact that we chased up several times to say we wanted to be part of that consultation. And absolutely no changes were made at all. The same thing was basically recommended. The councillor who asked really pertinent questions on behalf of the community was summarily removed within 24 hours. The video of that meeting, which was you know, watched more than 700 times with dozens and dozens of, 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 of comments. So that's the sort of community engagement you surely want when people are actually interested in something and following it. That was removed from the RBKC's YouTube site. And um, it was basically, I don't really understand, therefore then that comment my councillor Evans about scrutiny being much better and there's, there's, being, there's three new chairs and Councillor Ross is saying that we've been open uh, and, and things have improved. They haven't. That's the point. And, and that's why, as Ed Hammond says, you know, it remains at an extremely low ebb and it's going to be extremely challenging unless you take your heads out of the sand and stop making these general generalizations okay, with Kimia. no actual forensic evidence. Let me say we're open in the sense that we allow people to come into our meetings and to address the meeting. I mean, it might not be enough. That's what I'm saying. When I say open, that's what I mean, that we do allow people to come and address us. That's all. Is we would like it to be more of a discussion, not you go five minutes, go, and then that's it, your mic is off. I mean, look, Ed Hammond is telling you there is a problem here. And that problem is, being, is, 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 is it continues as long as councillors come here and say everything is fine and everything is better. It's not. We can show you the forensic evidence of that. And even when it is evidenced and recorded, the, the video is taken off the... The, the, the website is taken off the YouTube channel so that people can't share it, can't watch it, and can't comment, and can't engage. Okay. That's what happened. Okay, David. thank you, Kimia, and thank you, David and Abbas, for well, coming tonight. Thank you, Chair, but I just wanted to say that I think it is really important to have a two-way conversation in all of these meetings. And okay, the, the thing... I, I, I'm not trying to speak over you, Chair. I just wanted to say that you said one point earlier on about culture. And cultural change is what needs to happen in the council, because the culture that led to the fire I needs to change. And that will only change if scrutiny does its job can, and can, forces can, changes to, to proposed bills. So I'm going to have to think about that. The, the, the thing about the scrutiny, can be, we, we, it's a council meeting, and so we do, it, we ask people to talk, but they don't, they're not part of the committee. But that doesn't mean that's the only way, that there must be other ways of having, um, like this is a meeting held in public rather than a public meeting. And maybe we can arrange some other way of um, having other meetings. I don't know, I'm looking at Jackie now to bail me out, but. Um, yeah, this, this is a council meeting, a meeting of the councillors. So you've been invited to share your experiences and give your views, which you've done. Um, I think it was um, one of the councillors earlier in discussion said, could we produce some kind of council good practice guide on particularly for the working groups? So I would lead on that with my team. And it's, I think, more through the working groups that there is the discussion that you're talking about and the evidence collecting and things like that. So um, we'll look at that as part of developing the good practice. But constitutionally, this is a meeting of 
councillors. So obviously you've been invited to speak and made a contribution. So as the chair said, it's not a public meeting, it's a meeting in public, but we will look at um, methodology, how councillors gather views, what we do. If you have any ideas that you want included in that, happy to have further discussion. Um, because it's important that scrutiny does focus on the voice of residents, on your experiences. So, as I say, if you've got any ideas, as someone who lives on one of these dates, happy to have that discussion. You've got my contact details. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Kimia. Okay, so I'll just go quickly to the key decisions. Um, and basically, I have to ask any of the uh, any members if or chairs if there are any KDs that they would like to have further scrutiny on. Greg. Yeah, just on the penultimate page towards the bottom, uh, there's one that could be quite interesting for housing that I'd quite like to see something about, which is the second from the bottom acquisition of land in Holland Road as part of the new pro homes program. I'll point it out to Jackie afterwards just so she knows exactly which one it is. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other KDs that anyone would like to pick up? Yeah. It's you, since it's marked under, um, it's on the first page, the Business Improvement District for um, Brompton Road. This is marked for OSC. I don't have an argument with that, but I'm just wondering, are you going to be asking for a discussion on that or a presentation on that? Um, let me just see. It came up in the leadership team last night. Um, but I, I think, I think we're, the question I'm asking is not so much to do with Brompton Road as such. It's the, the whole model of business improvement districts that's been... Um, adopted increasingly or proposed for adoption increasingly for addressing the high streets uh, yes. issue now I, I, it's not this is not so much a discussion about which committee it ought to be in it's really how you see us as a scrutiny group overall addressing well, I, businesses. I know um, in the past and it must have been when Emma was not in the cabinet um, and it must have been when Malcolm was uh, chairing your committee will that we were going to do, me and Emma, were going to jointly look into something about the high streets. And that never happened, probably because Emma went back into the cabinet, or, or I can't remember why, but I would have thought now, um, it, it is actually even more important that someone takes a look at the, the high streets. And I think that could be added to um, the OSC list, perhaps. Certainly there's an environment dimension to it, but it's not only an environment no. select committee issue. So I think OSC is a good place for it because it has to do Jackie, with economy and a whole number of things. That, that was something we never got round to doing. And it is actually even more important. I mean, it, the high streets are much are worse now after COVID. So maybe it is something we should be doing. Yeah, it was on the reserve list. And yes, so I don't happened. think the work programme got as far as that, but um, okay. what I'll do to support the committee is I think I'll do some research into what might be going on in the council. I think the lead member may be doing some work on this, but I'm not entirely certain. So would I'll it, find out what's going on. Would it be Catherine Folks? It would be, yes. So which committee does she come under? I don't think she gets very much scrutiny. It would be actually. more to do with the committee terms of reference than it would the lead member. Okay. Um, so um, if it's the economy, I think it's more overview. But as okay. Councillor Pascal has said, there is a dimension here for environment. So if I do some research and yeah, drop something we'll up, so you can have a look. A possible thing that we ought to be looking at. Yep. I forgot mm -hmm. that earlier. Yep. Um, I would support it being an OSC as well, although we'd like to bring some thoughts to it. All right. And now I am going to say something else I forgot earlier. Um, when we were looking at the community safety plan, I was meant to ask if a member of the committee um, would be prepared to work with the scrutiny manager and community safety officer to develop the annual scrutiny for next year. 
So that, I'm just throwing that out if anyone. You don't have to decide now. <laughs> Uh, with yes. your permission, could I give some background on that request? Um, so I think, as you all know, this is the Crime and Disorder Committee for the Council, the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Every Council has to have a Crime and Disorder Committee. So the scrutiny that you do is an annual statutory scrutiny, and um, someone always comes from the Borough Commander's unit, and I think councillors appreciate that. I think tonight you had good information, asked good questions, and appreciated it. The scrutiny is of the partnership um, could be of the partnership, not just of um, the borough command unit. So potentially, there's an opportunity to do a little bit more scrutiny. And in line with comments that councillors have made about wanting to get out more, I think there's more opportunities for scrutiny over the next year if the lockdown is rolled back. So it was just to see if we could develop that scrutiny. I fully understand that the committee does not have capacity for another working group, and I'm certainly not suggesting that. But I just wanted to develop some ideas, and I thought as um, scrutiny as councillor-led, it would be useful if someone could just act maybe as a sounding board for me and the chief community safety officer, not to take a lot of your time up just to come with some ideas for how the scrutiny could be developed for next year. So that's why I asked. Okay, we'll take that one away and think about it. Or maybe put it with that, the high streets and just see how we're going to deal with it. Do you want me to volunteer it? for the guard room? If it's, if it's a sounding board, I think I've probably got the capacity to do that. If it's, if it's, act, if it's actually if it's doing a working group on my own, no, I haven't got the time to do that. But um, if it's... If it's it, uh, I promise it's not going to be... It's, if it's the odd... Yeah. Odd, oh, um, kind our of chatting to Jackie break. and perhaps reporting back to, to okay. one of these meetings. Uh, I, I'm sure I can cope with doing that. Thank you very um, much. And not within the next, um, not within the next couple of weeks. So please, Jackie. Probably not the next couple of months. I've probably forgotten I've taken it on then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Marwan wants to say something. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. And. Th I really am really grateful to uh, Jackie to, uh, uh, for her support in deciding and moving forward. Um, uh, I need your advice on two key decisions there on the um, direct award assessment. This is the last page uh, for Older People's Day Opportunity Services as well as the Home Care Services um, Future Provision uh, and uh, Direct Award. These two items, um, especially regarding uh, post-COVID uh, recovery and the provision and how this affects the, um, our uh, home cares, uh, I would like to have that uh, to be explored, if possible, uh, through a working group. Uh, so I would like to take that uh, opportunity to, uh, to further um, work with you, on, if possibility, on that. Uh, on those two key decisions. Thank so, you, Chair. Sarah? So I think the key decision there is about um, just because they've got to re-procure the whole home care, is they're going to do a direct award while they work on the re-procurement. Re it was supposed to have happened prior to COVID, but obviously COVID has delayed that and the other key decision. So I think it's a case of they've, they've had to roll it over for another year while they do the re-procurement. All right, uh, Janet, yes? I just wanted to ask uh, Jackie to chase up. We're expecting a report on the Kenzo Library in July. We'll be getting that? Um, I don't know if we've got the report, but we have got that marked down that you are interested in it as a select committee, your select committee's interest. Okay, thank Excuse you. Me. So officers know that. All right. So it just remains for me to say thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Um, thank you, Catherine and Martin, and especially thank you, Jackie. And um, I'm sorry it's late, but I think we've done enough for today. Thank you, sir.